meeting will please come to order. I'm going to ask you to stand and ask Brother Taylor to lead us a short word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the blessings of this, of this day and for this opportunity to come together at this time and under these circumstances to linger for a little while and to transact the business that may come before us. We thank thee for this membership, men and women that go to make up this body, and we <coughs> pray thy blessings upon it, upon us, each one individually and all of us collectively, that we may do the things, that we may say the things, that we may advance the cause of the working people in this community, this state, and that we be blessed of thee, the giver of all good gifts, and we ask it in the forgiveness of all of our sins, in the name of Christ our Lord. Now let me congratulate each and every one of you on your election to this board. We're looking forward to working with you. We're going to try to make this meeting as short as possible because I know all of you are tired as I am. But there are a few things that we have to do before you leave here. And that's what we ask you to meet here this afternoon about. First thing we'll want to do is to assign the duties of the two full-time officers. And in the past, Tom has been the Colt director, and uh, I have been assigned the duties of the legislature. Basically, this has been it. So we'd like for you to dispose of that first. Mr. Chairman, I would move that uh, the assignments continue. Assignments so continue as they are. As they are. Any discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. The next thing that I would want to propose is that Mr. J.W. Rainey <coughs> be given a title as an assistant legislator, as a legislative assistant to me. I'll so move. I'll second. Any discussion on that? All in favor of the motion signify to say an aye. Aye. The next thing we need to do is to elect a WAD director, a state WAD director. We'll reaffirm the one we have. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I uh, take this opportunity as president of Local 3517 of the Communication Workers of America as a vice president of the Mississippi FLCIO, and I deem it a extent pleasure to nominate Ms. Betty Sue Riley from who is treasurer of Local 3517 Communication Workers of America in Tupelo, Mississippi, as the WAD director for the state of Mississippi. I'll second Brother Edwin's nomination. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? For the third and the final time, are there any other nominations? I see she's mighty nervous. Right <laughs> 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 you have a hot coffee on those. Here and here and no other nominations, we now declare the position of WAD director. Our nomination is closed. Do I hear a motion should be elected by acclamation? All in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. 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 opposed? <laughs> now, in the past, in the past, we've also assigned a, a, a uh, title to Bob Woodson as the head of our minority division. And I'd like to submit that thing to you this time. This is our title that he's, he's had in the past, that he was in charge of uh, the I move that Brother Woodson continue in that position. Second. Any discussion? Not all in favor of that motion signify to say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carried is no order. Now the convention site business. Let me <coughs> say that next year will be a, we'll have to have a Coke convention, but we don't know when it will be because we don't know what's going to happen to this open primary law that the legislature passed if the Attorney General approves it. 
but it means that the June primary will be eliminated and we, the election won't come until October. That's the first primary under that thing. But if it's disapproved, the primary will be in June as it has in the past. The first primary will. Which means that the convention would probably have to be much sooner than it would if the, if the old primary thing uh, <coughs> comes off. About the only thing that I can see you to do is to select the site, the town, and then let us set the date as things develop and select the place. Uh, Chairman, uh, I'd like to make a motion if we uh, turn this thing a little stone night here and get us some uh, <coughs> recommendations on that thing of war and uh, things like that. Something that can be worked for, yeah. can be worked out and then, then we uh, agree on the thing next year. So, okay, all right. But, uh, but it the cold conference, and then of course we, we also, I think, need to decide where you want your next biannual convention held. Because this hotel thing is getting to be, you have to get your name in the pot a couple of years in advance with a lot of these places now. We'll have a new one in Jackson. We'll have a new one in Jackson by the time we have our next regular convention. And chairman, uh, I still agree with that, like I said, you selected this site. Yeah. Had a wonderful time. I think we've had a wonderful convention. Yeah. But I still think uh, <coughs> annual. legislature will be in session uh, when we have our next biannual convention uh, now that they're meeting an annual session so when we set it we'll certainly schedule it while they're in town you can be assured of that to be what you said well do we have a motion that the hope con the convention and the biannual convention be uh, held in jackson we can at least decide the site we can very well set the date i'll just combine both of them with All the right. same thing let tone work out something all right something we well, you're not saying that you set uh, Jackson, are you? We set in the town. Well, just turn over to Tom to pick out a place, and I feel sure it'd be in Jackson. But uh, I just add that in my motion. Make both of them the same, and uh, let him work out some place. Right. If you don't like what's happening, you can have somebody to jump over. That's Jackson. right. <laughs> and then as soon as you get through that, I'm going to say that. the motion here is then that this matter of uh, convention site and place be turned over to Brother Knight. Right? Okay. Report back. All right. Of course, we'll be having a board well, That meeting don't mean that they'll be held at the same town. That don't mean he has to get them both at the same town. No. So no, 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 no to him. He might find that to have it in another town in Mississippi would give us political strength or something in that area that well, we might right. Well, then he'll have a, uh, Well, he'll have that power if he wants to bring it to car rent. Then he'll bring it to car rent. Oh, it's cold convention. <laughs> All right, you heard the motion. In other words, it's pretty well placing in Tom's night, uh, in Brother Knight's hand here. Any any further discussion? Not all in favor of the motion, signify it to say aye. 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 Oh, motion carried the sword. So oh, can I say one other thing here? Yeah. Can I say one other thing? Oh, wait just a minute. Let's see what what is the problem here. No, she's not looking for problems. Huh? Okay. I just want to say that I, for one, and hats off to everybody that worked on this convention. The thing has gone off smooth, everything planned and organized, and for all the office help, and Tom, and you, and everybody that's had anything to do with standing with it, I think it's, it's a wonderful job, and my hats off to you. Well, thank you, sir. I think it's one of the best we had myself. We had a little luck with it, I guess. We just had one foul up from the mayor of late. I didn't know he was here, but he wasn't here. The gentleman got up to introduce him. I thought he was there. That's the first time I've ever had to interrupt my speech in about the middle ways of it to introduce the mayor. But outside of that, <laughs> he was uh, real well, I, good. I draw wise to the fact that he was introduced and somebody wasn't there after he started. But he I did. Didn't stop. I didn't. If I'd have known the mayor wasn't there, I'd have suggested to wait till he got there. Anyhow, I, I do appreciate your, your, your remarks there, and of course I know that Miss Phillips and Tom and everybody else appreciate it. What a very good convention. Tom, um, do we have anything else now other than setting salaries that we need to consider uh, at this meeting? Lord, I'd like to say just a minute. I know they're in a hurry, but I think this is a good thing. We're having, as most of you know, an awful lot of problems. 
certain areas more than others with these local labor camps. Now this is a sore spot, it's a tough spot, and it's something, frankly, I don't think any of us have any solution to. Uh, and this is the organization that has got to coordinate our program at the local level. And I would just like to encourage each of you to put everything you have in the council in your area. Unfortunately, the one that's in the worst shape not represented here, and that's Natchez. I'm afraid the AFL-CIO and Brother Smith here, the next thing we hear from them will be asking for the chart of that organization. I can't blame them because we've done everything in God's world we can to reactivate that council, and those people just don't think enough, apparently, of their own welfare to as many as three come out to me. And frankly, I'm in my rose in. Now, we do have some problems in other places, in Hattiesburg, one place where we got problems. Some of you from areas where you're really doing a good job. And for goodness sake, keep that up. And those of you in areas where they might tend to drag a little, why get right in there and put all the punch you possibly can in there because if we don't have an uh, active, effective local council, then this is a, just like putting a straight pin link in a log chain as far as our program is concerned. And on the affiliation, if you no other local union in the area that's not affiliated. If you can get an invitation, in addition to your many duties, try to get it. If they want one of us, let us know. We're ready. But the thing, that's one of the key problems we got is getting affiliated. And we've got to try to continue to build this organization. If we can, with the help of Stan Smith here and what he can do in Washington. So if there's any local in anybody's area not affiliated, if they'll but give us an invitation, we can't just go barging in and take over. But if you can get us an invitation, if you can make the meeting, fine. The more meetings you make, the less we got. So yeah, well, that was the next item I had on the on the agenda here to bring up briefly. We what we what we'll do about this is to compile. Well, we want to try to get the director brought up today for one of these days to give us time and we have all of you a copy of it. But in the meantime, we'll try to make available to you a list of locals that are not affiliated and ask you to do what Brother Knight mentioned here and set up meetings <coughs> and get them to come in. Now, we've been doing an awful lot of work on this, and we've had some success that uh, you need to know about. Uh, as we pointed out, the affiliation figure is higher now than it's ever been, but most of them are really chartered organizations. Uh, people like Ray Smith are. Clayton Moss, uh, you know, when they organize the local, James Jackson, Cole and Wilkins, you don't have to worry about them. They, they all take care of this matter and they automatically affiliate. Some of the others won't do this, and Brother Knight and myself have to go in and talk to them. I don't mind it, I like to do this, but it does take an awful lot of your time. You see what I'm talking about, especially when the legislature is trying something like this. Now, I want to read you your short letter here whereby we've got two locals by, the, by embarrassing. And this brother Grassy, the furniture worker, was here today on the Union Labor Program. I'm not going to read all of the correspondence to you, but I received a letter from him asking our support of their boycott and so forth. And then I wrote him a letter back. Dear sir and brother, I'm in receipt of your letter of July 7 advising me of your strike with the Brown Manufacturing Company in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. You have my assurance that we will do everything possible to assist you. Our fifth annual convention begins in Bluxa on July the 27th, and the enclosed piece of material is being placed in the delegates' kits. As you will note, it includes the information you relate to me in your letter. <coughs> Unfortunately, your Mississippi locals are not affiliated with us and will not receive this information since they won't have delegates at the convention. I would suggest that you see what can be done about this problem. It is just a little ironic that you call on us for help when your locals are riding free. Well, needless to say, I got a telephone call a few days later from a gentleman by the name of Leroy Clark, who is one of their vice presidents 
and who was in Canton, Mississippi, and I went up and helped him organize the plant that he never did affiliate. But he called me and assured me that they would be affiliating shortly, and one of their representatives handed me two affiliation blanks for two locals that affiliated during the convention. We got two out of three of them already as a result of this letter. We've got another situation, and one of the major problems is with the with the woodworkers, and I've got a whole stack of correspondence between me and the president uh, uh, about that situation. Of course, Stanton's been working on that also, but we do feel, uh, with some encouragement from people like you in the areas where we have woodworkers like your town, Clark, you've got a whole few of them over there, that there is a good possibility maybe we can improve that situation, woodworkers primarily. Then I've got some meetings set up with some of the paper makers and some other groups that we feel reasonably sure that we will get affiliated before the year is up. And of course, J.W., you've got two or three firefighters local, and Oliver told us that he's going to make sure they get them in. Well, we I, think, I think we just about to scratch on a few of them there, and yeah. I think if... Uh, this Hartzog seems to be a pretty good he, rep. He, he seems is, to be pushing this more than anybody that they've ever had. He's pushed it hard at several yeah. central labor meetings up there in front of in front of us, and we knew right. that he was pushing it. And uh, he broke some arms back behind him, seeing to it, right. twisting on him. And I think the the oldest help on this thing, and Brother Smith there, he'll kind of <coughs> twist the arm way up high up there. I believe we're just about to scratch on them things. I think that'll be one of the big progresses in this state. Oh, I think I, you know, it's one of the largest groups in the state in total yeah. numbers. Yeah. yeah. Right. In fact, and we, we lost the only one they had. See, they went up on it for capital tax, and that's under I mean, this last series of letters. Now, let me, let me see. I want to read you one. I, you know, I get, get kind of frustrated on this, some of this stuff. Now, I'll read you this letter, and I won't go into it. Well, I got a letter from Margaret Dickerson, who used to be on the board. Uh, the only local we had affiliated out of the, all of this group was that little local in Meridian. And she wrote me a very nice letter apologizing over the fact that they were having a withdrawal out. And I wrote her this letter. I said, I'm in receipt of your letter of June the 18th in which you advise me that your local union is drawing from the state FLCIO. I do appreciate your kind rem remarks, but regret very much the learn of this action on the part of the local union. As a former member of our executive board, I'm sure you realize the importance of each and every local union being affiliated and helping to carry the load. I sincerely hope your financial condition will improve in the near future and that you will be able to reaffiliate with us. And here's the letter that I wrote to the President Rowley of that organization. As I said, enclosed you to find a copy of the letter and close to the school board. It says, I'm enclosing a copy of the letter by me to Stan Smith, coordinator of state and local central body. I would believe you will find both self-explanatory. Goes without saying, I would appreciate your help in affiliating all of the IWA locals in the state. I'm sure all of these local unions are opposed to our so-called right to work law, yet they are willing to be free riders as far as the state FLC is concerned. I can give up on some of these cats. I'm going to call a spade a spade, you know what I mean. And this is what I wrote to Stanton. So it includes you'll find a copy of a letter I've just received from Margaret Hicks advising me the local 5-305 IWA has voted to withdraw from the state council. I'm also enclosing a copy of my letter to her. For a number of years, this was the only IWA local affiliated with us, and its law simply means that we do not have a single local affiliate. As you know, IWA is one of the larger groups in the state, and we sorely need full affiliation and cooperation from all of them if we are to do the task before us. Frankly, I'm fairly burned up about this entire situation. As you know, we've had a hell of a time. And we've know, as you know, we have taken a hell of a lot of abuse from certain elements in the state down through the years because we have upheld the FLCO's position on civil rights. As a matter of fact, I've had my life threatened on occasions because I would not yield on this issue. Many of the IWA locals are predominantly black, and as a matter of fact, several locals are all black. How in the hell do we cope with this kind of a situation? Any advice you may have will be appreciated. Well, I said that to Mr. Rowe, and of course, I got a pretty nice letter back from it. But uh, that's the situation. I think it's going to improve. We got some promises from some of the government people. 
We've affiliated some of the AFG locals. There's a big local here at Keesler that we hope we'll get before long with about a thousand members. But in addition, you see, to the affiliation, the dues money, we got to have the people, we got to have the names and addresses of everybody to do an effective job, you know, next year in the election. Now, that's about all I got to say on the affiliation thing. I think we ought to get out and let them talk about the salary situation. Uh, we got Brother Smith in here. I asked him to, to uh, if possible, to attend this meeting uh, because uh, of, the, of the money situation. I've done advice to you folks at the prior meeting of the, of the salary situation as far as my own personal situation is concerned. He got some information you need to hear and so forth. And I think it'd probably be best if Cal and Tom and myself and Betty Sue went out for y'all took care of this matter without us questioning. Okay? All right. Are you gonna put the charge to preside? <laughs> you can preside, or <laughs> Mr. Jackson. You don't want me to <clears throat> No, no, cut the tape off. I got to put down. Are you organizing a new union out here on this Gulf Coast? Bob and Hope, Hope and what have you. And, and that's reading really out late. Mine's about 500 numbers. Before I give you back your chair, yeah. the board, after discussing this at great length, decided that, uh, uh, that, that uh, really they got more mileage out of volunteers than they do out of paid people. <laughs> and since you all were dedicated and thoroughly to the welfare of the labor movement, they thought, they thought that you would like to contribute to your services. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and be put on the same salary as the vice president. Right. Right. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> now they had their part. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lick well, well <laughs> delivered. <laughs> well delivered. <laughs> okay. Being serious, the board action was to fix the salary of the president at $13,250. Salary of the Secretary Treasurer at twelve thousand five hundred dollars per annum, effective August one, nineteen seventy. Two days. Two days. Yeah. Well, That's a little better than seventeen percent. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, well, give it back to you, my friend. Well, 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 now that's what I, I was going to ask you uh, about the about that part of it. Uh, if uh, we get in trouble, uh, you will continue the subsidy we get now. Right. And then if we, if we that, get in we trouble, <laughs> Father, that uh, you'll see if there's any more in the pot up there, right? Right. All right. Well, I hope that we then don't you're have throwing to. your money away and wasting it. Well, we don't usually do we that. We haven't been doing that, so right. we count on the continuation of your presence. Right. right. Well. In the past, uh, we nice. uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've, got a, we've got an awful lot of work to do, and uh, frankly, I didn't want to get in a position where, uh, you know, where all you're doing is paying my salary and head. We got to have money enough to do the job with. You see, this is what I'm getting at. And as long as we got a large group of unaffiliated local unions, frankly, I just ain't going to go ask for dues increase. Uh, at all to these people in San Diego. You know, it's not right to them to ask them to pay more money to give me a better salary when we got uh, two thirds of the labor movement not paying any freight, you know. So I appreciate what you've done here. I really do. I know that you had to do a lot of straining to do this. Now, do we have anything else here that needs to be discussed before we break up? Anything else? Stan, we appreciate you coming down, old friend. We always look forward well, to seeing you. Well, you always manage Carol. to extract the money out of it. Well, Miss Phillips will get you some vouchers and what have you. We got the checkbook here, and if you want to. Uh, 
pay your expenses. Maybe, 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 maybe we already got our pay oh. before we yeah. go. Well, tell them, <laughs> well, tell the new board, we'll tell you the new board desk that your expenses up to this point will have to be borne by whoever sent you here, but any expenses incurred after your installation there will be paid by the state FLC. You spend the night tonight, you can charge that off to us. All right. Well, well, if I'm in order, I, I would like to say something, you know, to the board. Right. As uh, director of the minority division of the state council, uh, as you may know, on the first night of the convention, there was a meeting call of black trade unions who were delegated at this convention. I want to ask. No, I want y'all to listen to what he's what he's going to say. I want to ask uh, members of the board here to give me their cooperation in trying to implement the program that I'm trying to do. And I want you to understand that what we are trying to do is not black separation, but black participation. Uh, we are calling a meeting in Jackson later on in August statewide meeting to try and get the black trade unions in the state of Mississippi to fully participate in the positive programs that is being projected by the labor movement. This is politically and all other programs that are going to be beneficial to the community. And one thing in particular to try and curtail the activity of these black Cadillacs and white Cadillacs that Tom described. <laughs> so whenever you are uh, hear of us calling a meeting of black trade unionists, I don't want you to think that it's for any other purpose other than trying to get black participation into this movement, and I'm certainly asking your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Well Thank put. You. Well put. Of course, what you're going to do is exactly what we've been suggesting you do, is to try to develop the leadership of the black labor leaders in the community right. where they don't, where the black Cadillac crowd is running them off in the wrong direction, right? right? Okay, well, we appreciate that very much. Do we have anything else? Now, anyone else want to say anything before we adjourn? Not the meeting will stand adjourned. Good luck to all of you on your way in. I hope that you drive safely. Right. Invitation. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the blessings of this day and for this opportunity that it, that it affords us to meet together to discuss the problems that confront us and is probably the means of bettering our condition uh, where we come from and where we feel. We thank thee for the season of Thanksgiving that we've just gone through. We trust that every day will be a day of Thanksgiving and uh, for all of the blessings that thou hast so graciously bestowed upon us. Guide us and direct us through the activities of this day. Forgive us of all of our sins and shortcomings. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I think I'm going to. Tom, would you push that door too? I mean, I guess in case somebody comes in. I know that all of you have a lot to do, and you want to try to get through and out as fast as you can, so we'll try to move the meeting along as fast as possible. We have a number of things to bring before you today and get some decisions on. I'm going to just brief, briefly run through the agenda that I've outlined here. Of course, some of you might have something you want to add on. <laughs> but uh, well, I just recently mailed out to you a proposal on uh, developing some new uh, arbiters by P Professor Alex Simon from Mississippi uh, at Ole Miss. I went up and spoke before one of his classes. He teaches a class on arbitration, I'm on uh, collective bargaining, and that's old mess. And while I was there, he got to talking to me about this arbitration problem, the shortage apparently that's developing. Talked to me about a proposal he had. He's been talking to people in the Department of Labor and the uh, business community and what have you. And after I read the proposal, I thought it would be a good idea to ask him to come down and meet with our committee. And if you like that, we might go on record in support of it, which would give him a little 
more impetus, I think, in selling it elsewhere. Anyhow, he's supposed to be here at 11 o'clock. So we'll be with you. And of course, the main order of business, the main reason we call the meeting today is to talk about <coughs> the, the uh, union prescription drug program that uh, we've been uh, investigating. Mr. Roger Priora, who uh, uh, the chief uh, salesman, or whatever you want to call him, of that program will be at the airport at 11.50. I have to line to pick him up and we'll bring him back in here. We want him to get into this with you. That's the main thing we call this for. I was, when I was in Kentucky, I learned of this program and, and saw what they were doing in Kentucky with it, and I thought it was the kind of a thing that maybe we ought to investigate. All right. <clears throat> then we, Tom wants to talk to you a little bit about a, a booklet that uh, he's been working on that will outline the F state FLCL and his program and what, the, and what we're trying to do. Uh, we want to talk with you a little bit about some plans for next year and when we need to have a full board meeting. Uh, I want to talk to you about the possibility of instigating a court suit on board of residency here in the state. Uh, we want to touch briefly on the affiliation thing, give you a report on that. We want to talk to you a little bit about the legislative fund, the resolution we adopted for that special fund at the convention. And I've got a note down here to give you some McKinley literature that I've just recently received. Oh, <laughs> and <laughs> Again? And uh, we want uh, Tom to go into this new <laughs> consumers organization that he's been working with, some folks out of the university and what have you. And then we're going to also want to review with you some of our other activities in connection with the Voters League and stuff of this kind. So we'll try to get some of these items out of the way before these other people get here. And the first thing that I want to take up with you is this matter of the possibility of getting into a, into a, going into federal court with a lawsuit on board of residence and, and, and residency requirement to vote. Just pass that around. I'll let you all read that story, and then I will uh, uh, take it up. Was this the, the story that I passed by? Has everybody read it through reading it? The story I passed, as you notice, was Dateline September 1. It's a, it's a story, of course, about a, a, a decision that was rendered by a three-judge panel in Tennessee. Now, George Barrett, uh, the attorney that we're talking about here, is also the attorney for the Rubber Workers Union. I know George myself. I've met him and have had some, uh, in other words, I know him well enough to talk with him. Now, the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is this. I have checked to see if the ACLU intended to file a suit in, in the state on this, and uh, they're not in a position to do so because of they don't have any money. And uh, <clears throat> I thought it might be, and I've talked with the lawyer, uh, who I consider to be one of the best lawyers in the state. His name is Frank Parker with the Lawyers Committee here. 
is uh, uh, what you consider a constitutional lawyer. You, all of the lawyers here, when they get in a tight and they want some expert opinions, they go to him. Anyhow, I, I thought maybe that we might ought to consider this uh, possibility ourselves because of uh, the, the development that's going on in our state. We'll be having, uh, within the next year, I venture to say four, five, six thousand new people move to Pascagoula with a shipyard. They're going to come in here and they will not be able to vote in next year's election because of the one-year residence requirement here. Therefore, I thought I'd bring this up in this meeting and see if you would like to get into it. Frank Parker tells me, this is a lawyer, that uh, that he'll handle a case for nothing but court costs. And I made an inquiry of him what he was talking about, and he said three or four hundred dollars. At the present time, our situation, I suspect, on, on residency requirement is about the same as they had in Tennessee. What I'm looking at primarily is our own people, that, uh, or at least potential members that will be coming in and won't be able to vote for a period of a year if they get here. Uh, Claude, did we get any relaxation uh, on the laws out of the last session, the last session of the legislature? Not on, on the residency. If you remember, we adopted, we finally got a constitutional amendment to that, that lowered it from two years to one, you remember, and then yeah. the district, I believe it's three months. That's where it used to be six. Right. Yeah, I believe that's six. correct. Isn't that correct, Tom? Well, just about I cut it in half was about six. But you still have to be in the state a full year to vote. You have to be a resident at least a year to vote in any election. Now, I don't know whether they've uh, uh, Tennessee appeal this decision or not. Uh, I didn't call Barrett uh, about it because I wanted to wait we had a meeting get your opinion on it, see if you thought we ought to get into it or not. Now, this uh, proposed uh, suit would be, uh, of course, instituted in the name of the AFL-CIO. Yeah. Would there probably be uh, some other organizations that might want to? Well, I'm sure there'd be some other organizations that would like to. Uh, Voters League or some of those. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some yeah. some other organizations would like to get in it, but I don't uh, I don't know of any that's got any money. Well, I wouldn't think so much about yeah. the money if it's going to be to yeah. just two or three hundred dollars yeah. to the. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've talked with uh, so impetus you might right. say, might have. Right. Well, I don't think there's any question but what a lot of people, a lot of groups here in the state, the, the Voters League, especially groups like this that we work with, but what wouldn't support this? I've talked to several, the, incidentally, already about it, the ACLU and the <coughs> Voters League. Uh, How about the Women Voters League? I'm sure the League of Women Voters will go along with it. Uh, of course, they don't take a position on political issues or candidates, you know. They, they, they run more or less an educational program. But again, the Voters League is not <coughs> an organization that we support. You know, we make regular contributions to them. But as far as support, uh, moral support, uh, wouldn't we have to have some union member that was uh, in the state less than a year was trying to vote, though, to start the suit? I mean, Might. can you just as an Might. organization file such a suit if it's going to give no relief? Might well have to do that. Members. I don't know. Yeah. Question now, uh, <laughs> this is the... This fella, this fella is the one this that... This was a professor here. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, we might, have to plan, we might have a plan. We might have to find a plan if That's I don't what know. I'm saying. The main yeah, thing I, was that I, I wanted so. to find it if you wanted us to get into it. Now, know. if we have to find the plaintiff, then if you want to yeah. do this, this is what we'll do. Yeah. Whatever the lawyer yeah. would, uh, would recommend. Would recommend. Mm -hmm. And, of course, get as many uh, other organizations, mm -hmm. if they can, if they can um, pay a little something out of the token. Right. Well, all right. right. If they can't, well, all right. That would be my well, One other question, Claude, just and of course the lawyer would probably have to answer this but mm -hmm. since you don't know where Tennessee the state of Tennessee appeal, appeal is ruling right. you really don't know where this ruling is going to stick right? No we'll have to get into all of that I mean uh, see I haven't If made it don't the stick then where would they appeal at the United States Supreme Court? Right. And how well as I, as I understand it that's where this appeal would be made this is a right. three judge a three judge panel, panel. Right. Now, of course I don't know whether this would go into a district court first or not um, but it, it wouldn't be but two steps, even if it did, that would be a district court and then the uh, a circuit, fifth right. circuit, I guess, probably would have it. 
Oh, the other point Supreme I'm making Court. is apparently there has been no ruling by the Supreme Court on the matter. And it's still well, if, if, the, if the state of Tennessee didn't appeal this case, then it would stand. You see, it'd be up right. to Tennessee as to whether they appealed or not. If it was an it appeal, was. then automatically the, the, the three-man uh, yeah. decision stands. Right. It stands in Tennessee. Right. That's what I mean in Tennessee. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But if we Tennessee. file a suit here and the yeah. federal courts agree, then the Mississippi appeal, it would still go to the United States Supreme Court. Yeah. we get an answer to the point Probably. I'm making. Well, this is, what, this, is what, <laughs> this is what I understand Barrett to say, right. that they're going to file, they want suits filed in all the states to carry the Supreme Court right. to knock out the residency requirement. <clears throat> what do y'all think? Now, if you want, if you think it's worth getting into, I'll, uh, of course, follow through with all of this and check it out with, uh, with Barrett in Tennessee to find out where, what the status is. And if we have to have a plaintiff, then we'll have to search around and find one, uh, which ought not be too difficult. You know, but all of this we can work out if you think it's worth getting into. Uh, May I ask a question? You you mentioned about three or four hundred dollars. Uh, is that uh, is that the maximum to carry the thing's conclusion or? Well, I asked him how much money were we talking about. He said he says three or four. And he said I don't think it run over five. Of course, if you know as this thing develops, if we have to go all the way to the Supreme Court and it looks like we got to spend additional money, I wouldn't spend it okay until I had another meeting of the committee to see what they thought. But as I understand a case of this kind, it's more or less routine because the, the case has already been argued and, and ruled upon by the courts, you know what I'm talking about, and it's just kind of a, uh, uh, when you get into a case like this in a federal court, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of automatic is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It means there's not a whole lot of research and everything has to go into this thing. Now, that's already been done in the Tennessee case. Is this pertaining to uh, all state elections, Carl? I would say so. Yeah, that's what I would say. State and federal, I imagine. Yeah. Is, this, period. is this what we're fixing to get into if we lower this requirement? I don't know if it matters a lot. No, I can see some unfairness. Mm -hmm. With your migratory people like uh, we have in our group. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> with elections running from June to November. Are we saying that they can, uh, well, just say that we can place some people on the job in uh, Florida mm -hmm. vote in Florida. June? We get down there, establish a residence. You can give a mailing address, and you've got an established residence. Mm -hmm. uh, go over here and register to vote. Well, next month, Tennessee has uh, an election coming up. It just so happens we can place some. Uh, construction workers in Tennessee in uh, July or August, uh, they can cast a ballot in an election in Tennessee. Uh, September, we've got an election <laughs> back in Mississippi, so... Uh, they can come home and vote? Well, they come home and vote. Uh, I don't think this is the intent of an election I don't think law. so either, and of course that's something <clears throat> that, uh, that we'll have to certainly clear mm -hmm. up. I'm sure that what, the, what they're trying to do is make it possible for a person to vote, especially in a presidential election somewhere. Right. If he's moved to, you know... Congressional or presidential. Right. There's right. another angle right along this same line, and uh, it's one I've just thought about. Uh, if the state's mentioned in this document the only state that has such a requirement, all the other states have none? No, no. Uh, I think they've got voter residency requirements in all the states in this area from across the board. I think so. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. But we are apparently targeting all of our activities on just a small group of the states. Yeah. states is, it? is he here? Tell him just to have a seat and I'll, I'll be with him. Just the point I'm raising is, say, uh, of course, Mississippi's got uh, all sorts of problems. But say that uh, a bunch of these, whatever you want to call them, yippies, hippies, hoppies. No, I'm talking about these real far out folks. If you change this clause, what's going to keep them from uh, a dozen universities over the country uh, merging on Mississippi one summer and leaving you long enough to vote and elect certain people and leave again? And is this good or bad? Well, you reckon it's bad. You well, reckon there'd be that many moves here? Well, uh, you would well, have it to is move or just isn't the it? residents during the voting period. 
Mike it could be a deliberate thing is what I'm saying. Not migratory, but deliberate. My concern is this, uh, creating some uh, friends rather than enemies. If we support such an issue of this, we need to answer it as to what right. we're really talking about. That's what the reason I'm raising this question. Rather than to come up and support a, a suit to promote this. And uh, we're well, talking about all these migratory and Maybe I should uh, <laughs> call or write George you Barry. See what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. And get uh, an answer to some of these questions you're raising. And we'll probably be I having a board to meeting to come to in the next week. Uh, <coughs> next, next uh, probably around the first of February. Maybe I could get that information mm -hmm. from George Barry to just what the decision does mean and who are we talking about. Right. right. And then maybe if you if you like me to, and then we can take it up and make a decision at that time. Well, uh, what uh, James is talking about there. I understand what both of them are talking about. Uh, th that uh, this uh, uh, panel suggested a 30 day. Uh, well, I just, I just, wa I just wonder <laughs> if that uh, 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 isn't a little bit too short. Uh, say, if we had a 90-day uh, set up there, uh, this thing that you're talking about, uh, these people wouldn't hardly uh, uh, feel it worthwhile to uh, come into the state and, and stay 90 days. Would depend. Yeah. Uh, just uh, to, in order to cast a ballot. It'd be tougher on 90 yeah. days than it would on 30, mm -hmm. there's no question. Well, we have a 90 day residency now, don't we? We got no. that in the county. It's three months in the district and yeah. in the county. Yeah. Yeah. In the but state. you still yeah. have to be in the state of right. residency. You have to be here a year, a year before. Yeah. Uh, but what well, they're talking about here is wiping it all out. Why don't you, why don't we get a motion authorizing me to investigate this matter with George Barrett, the attorney that handled it, and get the answer to these questions? I so move. Okay. I second the motion. All right. Any further discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signify to say an aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried with two orders. Well, I understand that Mr. Simon is out there, so if you'd like, I'll go get him and we'll get his uh, proposal before you now. Here's Simon says, wig wig. <laughs> Simon says, <laughs> Simon says. <laughs> Simon says. <laughs> Did all y'all get one of these brochures on the on this uh, prescription drug? Yeah. 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 I forgot to bring mine with me. I read it at the time. Okay. I wanted to go on record. Mr. Simon, this is Mr. Knight over here. How you doing, sir? Hi. Right. Robin's Good over there. Robin? Shaver over there. Oh, nice. so, <laughs> it happens to be her birthday, and when we get through, we're going to have a birthday party. Uh, I'd like to get you, you in trouble. Before we put you on the, on the grid here, I'd like to go ahead and get rid of that hurry. Uh, I ex I've ex briefly explained to them, uh, Mr. Simon, about the, your proposal. As a matter of fact, I mailed out to them uh, uh, copies of, uh, of the proposal, asked them to read it to where they'd be in a better position to understand what we're talking about. Uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. And, uh, of course, you and I have discussed it quite a bit. So I thought it'd be good if you'd come down and... Uh, and go over it with them and answer any questions they might have because uh, I felt as I told you that uh, if we went on record in support of it, which puts the CFL-CIO on record in favor of it, it might give it uh, a little bit more impetus, so to speak, when you're around trying to uh, sell it to some other people. So with those remarks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you on and let you pick up from there. All right, well, uh, gentlemen, I, I got interested in... Mike, let me say in advance, I don't think I told you that he is a former union member. He's had some experience in the labor movement. He's uh, presently a member of the American Arbitration Association. And I believe you've been in the state now for how long? Since January. Since January. And, of course, I met him at the university where I went up and addressed the class that he teaches collective bargaining. 
So with that, you go right ahead. Now he, in one session, convinced these boys that all unions are not real bad, you know, in, in, in one, in one, one session. No, I was affiliated with the All Workers International Union Local 228 prior to World War II and after World War II and have an honorary withdrawal card. I don't even got a bachelor's, my master's, and subsequently my doctorate degree. I worked on the other side of the table when I was with Ford Motor Company as our labor relations manager and then certified by the American Arbitration Association and the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. And, but I've been concerned about a problem of, that uh, really a, a problem or a dire shortage of certified impartial in the United States with the growing need for more and more uh, of the services. Uh, it's estimated that the need will increase by another 15 percent now that uh, Presidential Order 10988 has been in effect for quite a while and then Nixon's Presidential Order. Uh, I was doing administrative work in the academic world, and then all of a sudden I decided that, look, if anybody's going to do anything about this, uh, somebody better start. And uh, Mr. Ben Fisher of the United States Steel Workers said it very well when he turned around and he said, the upgrading of new arbitrators for fully competent performance in labor management disputes remains one of the, one of the essential tasks of all participants in the field. The American Arbitration Association must bury its share, along with labor and management, in accelerating efforts to improve the quality and performance of a much larger group of arbitrators. The Amer American Arbitration Association should do whatever it can to promote the competence of the arbitrator, especially the large number of new men coming into the field. The complexity of the issues and the impact of decision-making is such as to demand a higher degree of competence for those who render final judgments. Some programs assure higher quality is sorely needed. So I started corresponding with uh, Mr. Strauss of the American Arbitration Association and uh, with Mr. Kurt, uh, J. Curtis Counts of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. They have a accepted the fact that there is a job to be done, but being the types of organizations they are, they say um, labor and management must take the initiative. They are the ones who will be using <coughs> these arbitrators, if any of them are to be used. Uh, they are the ones who will select new men. They are the ones who will attest to their uh, acceptability in reality because no matter whether or not a man is accredited or is on the books, if he's not acceptable. So after some correspondence, I went to Washington at Mr. Counts' invitation and visited with Mr. Counts, Mr. Maggiola, and the new chief counsel. Uh, they seemed to think that this should be more on a regional basis because uh, there are different uh, issues uh, in different parts of the country. Um, so I subsequently went to Mr. Usher's, directly to Mr. Usher's, and uh, he's assigned uh, Mr. Barrett to work with me on this. He, he feels, as I do, that uh, the National Union and the national spokesman for management should be the ones who would really decide what kind of a training <coughs> program we should have. Uh, they would be the ones who could jointly form a corporation <coughs> and uh, have an executive committee composed of eight or ten members uh, representing a cross-section of the unions in the public sector and in the private sector, a cross-section of uh, six, seven, or eight representing the management groups, uh, somebody maybe from civil service, uh, certainly a representative from both accrediting organizations, and maybe somebody from the Academy of Management. And if an organization of this kind were formed, a private, non-profit corporation with all of these uh, wheels in there, I see no reason why we couldn't get a federal grant and uh, conduct 
programs of this kind in different regions of the United States, and even going so far as to do some labor management relations training with uh, union officials and company officials, if this is needed in the South, especially when the school teachers and the state employees start organizing. So with that background, gentlemen, and y'all each have a copy of the proposal or have read it, uh, Secretary Hudson, I, I've been told to write directly to Secretary Hudson, and I have a letter from October 8th from the Secretary, and he is very enthused about something being done and points out that the in the area of public employment labor relations, the lack of trained neutrals, both mediators and arbitrators, is even more acute because of the lack of experience on the part of the parties in collective bargaining, and because collective bargaining has grown so rapidly in this last few years. And I see in the 39 states have already adopted legislation, uh, at least recognizing unions as uh, bargaining representatives for their employees. Two states have given the employees all of the rights of unionism, including the right to strike. You're talking about public employees? Yes, sir. State uh, employees. Pennsylvania and Hawaii. Right. Right. Yeah. And I see in a very short while that there will be legislation in all 50 <coughs> states with various kinds of recognition clauses. And certainly, rather than to have <coughs> strikes, in the state employees, especially school teachers, I would certainly like to see mediation and conciliation. An attempt to made first uh, for the strike in the school system is the only one that suffered about our children and not grandchildren. The, uh, one of the things that I was impressed on about your proposal is the fact that you point out, uh, this is getting away from the, from the uh, public side. But in your proposal, you point out the fact that most of the people serving on the American Arbitration Association today, the experienced arbiters, are getting up in age. Uh, and that, uh, you know, a lot of them are going to be retiring or dying or they're going to be out of the picture before long. And then there certainly will be an acute shortage of, uh, of arbitrators in this, in the, in the yes. industrial sector. Right. 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 Uh, this is one of the things that I that I have recognized. There are only about 600 that are certified by both AAA and uh, Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, and of that 600, at least 300 are no longer acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, and of the remaining 300, uh, I dare say about 250 of them are nearing retire will be retiring in the next 10 years. Well, they will, there's no question about it. Now, Mr. <coughs> Jackson here is with the Clothing Workers Union, the state director for the ACWA, this gentleman here. I might just tell you what you know, what uh, each one of them associated with. Mr. Schaefer is a member of IBEW. Mr. Jackson is clothing. For, uh, yeah. Utility local here in uh, Jackson. Mr. Robbins is, uh, is with the... That's Mr. Schaefer. Schaefer, S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R. Well, I'll give you time to write all this down right. as we go around the table. Mr. Ro uh, Robbins is with the Office Employees Union at uh, Angle Shipbuilding in Pascagoula. And Mr. Edwards is with the Communication Workers of America, CWA, at uh, Hell Telephone, yeah. uh, South Central, I believe yeah. they call it now. Uh, Communication. And in yeah. Tupelo. Yeah. And Mr. Taylor is a carpenter, a construction man. I noticed that your name. Uh, and uh, and Sam Nichols, uh, I believe I was advised. Uh, matter of fact, I had an inquiry from B. R. Upton that uh, Mr. Simon, Sam Nichols, and uh, Dr. Miley out Mississippi College. Uh, that's three people who have the state who are on the, the, the panel now. That they've been named uh, to handle the, the problems of the building trades group here. Uh, B. R. was making some inquiries to me just the other day, so. Even though most of the discussion here is going to center around public employees and industrial workers, which there still is an area in the, the building trades field where, where as things develop, it looks like that you're going to be <coughs> in the service of arbitrators more all the time also. Would you not say this? Yes, sir. The, uh, the master contract between yeah. uh, the construction the yeah. industry, whatever their association is, and the Associated Crafts names three arbitrators. Come in and resolve disputes rather than just 
spend 10 days riding to Washington and getting a list of seven people and then we meeting a week later and scratching out uh, one and somebody scratch out the other, you know. And so they named the, the three of us. If one is not available, then the next will serve, and if the, and then the next will serve. And Mr. Knight is uh, he's the secretary of the of the state organization. He and I are, he and I are the two full time officers. Now he's out of the clothing workers union. I see. And you have Mr. Taylor. Taylor. Marvin Taylor. 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 Yeah, yeah. I, did, I didn't have a chance to write that down. Now, for your information, all of us, besides Mr. Ramsey and uh, Mr. Knight, are vice presidents of the state body. Yeah, they all, this, the, the, this is the executive committee, five vice presidents and the secretary treasurer and the president. <coughs> we have a, have a 17 member board, uh, executive board, uh, you know, but in between meetings of the board, this group has authority to act and make decisions. Of course, we usually bring those decisions before the full right. board meeting. Right. Right. We had this meeting scheduled, and I thought it'd be good to, to invite you down. And well, I certainly welcome the opportunity. You want to go on record and support us? Well, well, I have two questions in mind. Uh, one, I understand the the ultimate of your proposal is training of new people to enter this field. Yes, sir. Uh, the people that are in the field now. Uh, how did they get their training? Was there any program of this type uh, or anything whereby uh, they uh, was accessible to them, or did they do it on their own? Well, the old War Labor Board set up a program to train mediators. A lot of them subsequently became arbitrators. But the rest of them got our union men who maybe had to held the national office at one time or another and got defeated or our business executives, uh, industry representatives in the field of labor relations who decided to quit and made application uh, or who were fired, uh, made application to the American Arbitration Association and you have to have five unions and five companies attest to your knowledge in the field, your some experience in the area of labor relations, uh, your impartiality, moral character, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before they become certified. Now there are some, and that's a, that's a good question because uh, Mr. Kleberg, Department of Labor, said, well, we're going to do a full training program of this kind. And so did Mr. Ustry, we were together. And I kind of grinned, I said, yeah. And you know, and I know, that from the point of view of an awful lot of other departments right there in the federal government, they will not be acceptable because whether or not it's their wrong, they'll perceive yeah. them as being pro-labor. Yeah. The, the institutes, a lot of higher, uh, colleges have labor relations institutes. They're training, but they come out and they're not acceptable to an awful lot of companies and to an awful lot of unions because they're, you know, quote, ivory tower. Uh, and some of them don't have the actual experience uh, uh, at the table. Uh, but really, to answer your question is no, that there hasn't been any definite program or effort made to really school and train people in this field. Uh, for instance, uh, let me tell you how, how Nicholas and Molly got on the, on the association. There's you know, Nicholas and Millsaps. Uh, what they did was they got, a, got the recommendations from a number of people, and of course one was, was out of this office, so I recommended both of them, uh, you know, and get some other people, and this is how they get on the association. And, and they really, it's an on-job training kind of a thing, I'm telling you. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, and you guys that have been handling arbitration cases know that, uh, that what you do when you get ready to arbitrate a case is you ask the association to send you a list of names, you usually get yeah. five. Yeah. The company strikes one, you strike one, the company strikes one, you strike one, you wind up with a third man. This is the usual procedure. Mm -hmm. And of course what you do is to start checking out the past background and Absolutely. history and decisions yeah. and oh, yeah. that the arbitrator's made and all this yeah. kind of stuff. You see how he's ruled in the past before you select him. Now what he's attempting to do here is I view it again, you correct me if I'm wrong, and that is to truly train a group of impartial arbitrators that would be acceptable for both labor and management. That, that would labor? not be tainted as being labor oriented, labor trained, or that would not be management 
oriented or management trained. Or academic. Isn't this really what you're right. trying to That's do? Or right. academic. That no, the no, union no. people <laughs> and the management people jointly decide what should be the curriculum. Uh, for example, in my original proposal, I even put out some uh, ideas uh, just to, uh, I think that uh, people should be trained. If we're taking a person had that, that has had no labor relations training in the university world, okay. Now, this could be a retired business agent. It could be some, some would not have, in other words, we'd have <coughs> two profiles of people. One group with experience, and the other group without experience. Those without experience, I think probably it would take, of course, this would be up to the executive committee to make the final decision. Mm -hmm. But I think probably it would take about four weeks, two weeks for intensive training on the history and philosophy and the psychology of the labor movement, the sociology of the labor movement, historical, legislative, and economic developments of unionism in the United States, labor legislation, the grievance process, <coughs> collective bargaining in the private sector, collective bargaining in the federal service, human relations, communication problems in collective bargaining, the uh, philosophical and sociological implications in arbitration, the actual arbitration process itself, and then a whole week of actual cases. <coughs> Every morning, three union representatives would sit on one side of the table and three management representatives would sit on the other side of the table and they'd have a grievance. And they would present their arguments just as they do and then the afternoon and then in the night, those 25 or 30 participants up there would have to write an award. And this award would be great. And we do this all week. And then uh, after that, if the academy is willing and if management and labor still insist upon more experience, uh, I'd suggest that maybe uh, he could be an assistant or an associate or an, or an apprenticeship ship system, you know, and go with one competent trained arbitrator, listen in, write an award, and send the award to the Central Committee, and let the Central Committee evaluate it along with the arbitrator's actual award. This is all well and good, and I admire you for your venture, and I think we all recognize a very definite need. The thing that disturbs me is simply this. We could put a man under such a program and train him for six months, 12 months, and bring him on three cases, and two of them is ruled against the union, and when it comes to selecting the fourth man to hear a case, he is not acceptable. Now, how are you going to overcome this? We look at past decisions that the man has rendered based on question that he's deciding. And for an illustration, we arbitrated a case, and as you know, a collective bargaining agreement is negotiated around problems confronting mainly labor. Well, <laughs> precedents that are workable very seldom enters into a collective bargaining agreement. We arbitrated a case with a 28-year precedent without a blemish and a man with a favorable background for labor decisions. And he gave us a decision similar to this because I permit the paper boy to walk across the corner of my yard for every day for five years and I decide I don't want him to walk there any further. I re uh, reserve the right to tell him not to do it and he ruled in favor of management on this particular past case. Practice. Right. Well, he ignores past practice. What past he training. completely ignores past practice and rules against us. Well, needless to say, he uh, on here's, the language a, of the agreement. here's a 28-year precedent without a blemish that's down the drain now. And it uh, pertains to job assignments. When a man is in location already, in classification, does he have a right to prefer a job? Well, this meant an awful lot to our people. We'd have been better off not to arbitrate. Needless to say, he won't hear another case for us. <laughs> I was going to say, you <laughs> probably won't pick him again. You know, I, I, had, a, I had one. Uh, every once in a while, as you gentlemen might suspect, this is not true so much in the South as it is in the uh, industrialized uh, West Coast. 
every once in a while a union would take a case to arbitration uh, uh, as a dog. Uh, just, uh, just to allow this arbitrator to rule in uh, favor of the company. So he wants, uh, because he's made two rulings in favor of unions mm -hmm. now, they would uh, flip him one. And management officials are doing the same thing. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, it's <laughs> it's dastardly. The, the life of an arbitrator, uh, uh, unless he is really lucky, short is lived. a very short-lived life. Uh, now, I've been fortunate. My first case, I had to rule in, in favor of Yellow Cab Company in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and, boy, I was scared to death that the union, uh, I'd forgotten to ask uh, whether or not anybody objected to the publication of this award. I had already, my secretary had already mailed the awards to, to the lawyers without, uh, <laughs> without asking me. And I called the, uh, the personnel manager of the company, who had been the union president for five years, and then was the personnel manager of the company. And I said, I'd like, I'd like to <laughs> That's publish. That's complicated. <laughs> I said, I'd like to publish this one. Uh, uh, should I call the, he, oh, said, go ahead. I said, shall I call the, the union uh, business agent? No, he said, let me handle that. No. Well, I call, uh, he, about two hours later, he called me, and he, he said, Dr. Simon, he said, I understand you'd like to publish this baby. I said, yeah, I sure would. He said, go right ahead. He said, you'd be doing us a favor. He said, we have 14 cab drivers that wouldn't, uh, dis disagreed with us in the change of a contract clause, and they were, they were actually uh, violating company rules and union rules, and we wanted to smack the heck out heck out of them. <laughs> 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 and he said, go right ahead. Uh, and said, I had a case in Grenada not too long ago, and uh, the international rep from Alabama, I think, said, I checked up on you. I said, I, I, I knew you would. I mean, it's, you, you better do your homework. And he said, I called a union in Montana. You had ruled in favor of the company. So I called a union in Montana. And they told me, use it. By all means, use it. We were forced to take this <coughs> case to arbitration. The local union didn't really want to. But the president, uh, I think it was the president's cousin, was the guy involved. And the president insisted and insisted and insisted and uh, hired a lawyer. Uh, we had to, and we didn't really think that we had a case. I have, on the other hand, I got one very one union in Denver and they'd recommend don't hire me. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd just say scratch him. <laughs> <laughs> well uh, I have I really have no complaint against any arbitrators and we've been real fortunate that we've had. I think all of them have been real competent people. But the one that really gets me is the one that in putting his decision together both sides are right mm -mm. and then leave you hanging and we've had this to happen <laughs> yeah. well i had one different both thing. sides are right nothing resolved i had one where the arbitrator <laughs> left the decision up to the man <laughs> wrote an award and right. said now you do what you want to <laughs> well uh, i don't i don't I frankly uh, frankly uh, you know i don't see any Today you decide. Uh, little problems i think they're here with us the state i really do don't you think they're here the state well, yeah, I mean those things. The uh, uh, this proposal he's got here, I think, will uh, will reduce might, that. It would reduce it. I don't think it'll ever actually eliminate it. No. Uh, but no. as I understand, as I view it, that is, of course, now if we can get the thing to go and we can get the management to support it and really, you know, make something out of it. I, as I view it, it will train some competent people that will provide to to fill up to take care of the shortage apparently mm -hmm. we're going to have down the road in a few years. Well, I think well, Dr. Simon has, yeah, has this proposal been, been uh, presented to uh, other people in the state of Mississippi, other no, uh, groups? Or no, Is this the first? Uh, this is it in Mississippi. I have sent a, a copies of the proposal to George Meany, and since um, Ben Fisher has um, been so vociferous, I thought Ben Fisher should get the courtesy of this. I've sent 12 copies of him to him and ask him to sort of scatter it out. But since Byrd has been appointed by the Secretary of Labor to, uh, he's the Assistant Director incidentally of uh, Labor Management Services, uh, I wrote and asked him, sent him 12 copies and asked him to uh, distribute copies if, 
in other words, through Mr. Meany, I asked him to distrib distribute the copies in the National Union, in the AFL-CIO, and not knowing who to write to in the ALA or for the various independents, I asked him to send copies to the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, the United Automobile Workers, the United Electric Workers, the United Mine Workers, the International Longshoremen and Warehouse Workers, the International Chemical Workers. Uh, Mr. Strauss, uh, I think, gives us a very, very good kick uh, boost when he said uh, he's the president of the American Arbitration Association. Question of people that uh, need to be sold this program would be the International Union back there. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, they are primarily, well, most in most situations, I say, the International comes in at the arbitration level in most uh, agreements. Uh, and, of course, uh, it varies from union to union as to who pays the cost. Uh, quite often the local union will pay it, sometimes the International will pay it. But sometimes it's good at the right. company. <laughs> Most of ours is split on but, the basis. But uh, as you pointed out, out there, the, uh, what you you're really not asking us for money. No, you, uh, you you're going to attempt to have this thing funded through uh, some well, of the OEO. Unless I mean, you, uh, not, not uh, necessarily OEO, but so maybe labor might even fund it. I've met with um, I've met with the American Society for Personnel Administration because at the same time that I sent my first correspondence to Barrett, I sent a covered copy of it uh, to. Union headquarters and a carbon copy of it to uh, ASPA headquarters. Now that's 8,100 personnel managers and copies of the proposal. And uh, three days later, or four days later, telephone call. Uh, Boy, uh, I'm really interested in trying to do something about this. So I'll get hold of our labor relations committee, and you'll hear from them. And about two weeks later, I got a letter from the labor relations committee. They met in Memphis so that I wouldn't have. Uh, too much travel expense uh, instead of having to go to Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, they they have endorsed the idea in principle, uh, but they they realize that the other side needs to be involved on it. Let's see, here's the letter that they wrote uh, to the executive vice president. The A ASPA Labor Relations Committee met in Memphis, Tennessee, November 12, 1970, to consider the proposal. Dr. Alex Simon for the establishment of an arbitrator's training and acceptance academy. After exploring this proposal pro and con for some time, it is the unanimous opinion of the committee that you recommend to ask the board of directors that ASBA participate in this endeavor to the fullest. Dr. Alex Simon, in cooperation with Dr. <coughs> Barrett, Assistant Director of Labor Management Services, has agreed to convene a meeting in Washington, D.C. on December 2nd. 1970 to consider his proposal with representatives from labor, government, and management present. Our committee will have requested furnish an appropriate number of members to attend the meeting. Well, this meeting has been called off, Mr. Ramsey. Um, Mr. Barrett called me and he said the secretary was uh, a little disturbed that not enough of the national unions had jumped on the bandwagon yet. They probably hadn't had time to infiltrated down to the proper person <coughs> who would, uh, in other words, just writing to to George Meany and sending him uh, 12 copies, he may send, send around to, to the, the president or the secretary of treasuries, but then it may be somebody in the labor relations or our uh, research department that have to look this over. In most cases, it's their chief counsel, yeah, their that's law, that's law that's legal. They mm -hmm. legal so they wanted more time. I think probably uh, well, it is nice. that you probably Legal need to try to do something with the regional the and district directors of the various unions uh, uh, who have control, we might say, of the field staff, the international reps who work directly under them. What do you think? Uh, you know what I mean? These, these, these are the people I think that you need to to start trying to sell the program to instead of starting at the top. Well, they're the ones that have to be convinced. Trying to go up, you see. They're the ones I think that are going to have to be convinced, and of course, if you convince them, they will convince the people over them. I think, and that's my own personal opinion. What do you call it, Claude? I think this is true, Claude. Uh, in our case, of course, Lou Sherman yeah. would be the, the man to really get to pushing it. That's in what I thought I would ask of you gentlemen: the names of and addresses of the person in your respective national unions that I should correspond with mm -hmm. and send copies of this proposal to. And 
brother didn't depend upon uh, Mr. Meany and Mr. Fisher uh, distributing the thing, I think I owe a letter to every international or national witness and a copy of it and so forth. I think I should pay them that respect. As I recall, uh, Dr. Fowler, uh, your proposal, and uh, I believe you are proposing that the program actually be operated by an executive committee made up of people, uh, an equal number of people from uh, labor and an equal number from management. Mm -hmm. Am I remembering right? Yes, sir. Even, even some of the <coughs> government unions, government employee unions should be involved, uh, in my opinion. Uh, then they could, at this one meeting, if it's everything is acceptable, they would elect, uh, say, eight representing unions and eight representing agencies and management or even five or six. Ashford doesn't care. They don't care. If they have two representatives on there, that's all they're interested in, two management representatives. If I, every in, international would have uh, a representative. Uh, it's their opinion that uh, uh, a curriculum would be to the satisfaction of everybody. I was just fixing to ask as to what degree is the management interested in such a program here. Of course, you were in correspondence there, I think, answering my question earlier on this. Well, they were ready to meet. Uh, their, it's at their request uh, that I retired from the conference room at, uh, at the uh, motel there in Denver and went to another room and called Mr. Byrne to establish a meeting on December 2nd. They wanted to get started on this right away. Now, I didn't have the foresight to think that, gosh, this has not been handled uh, to the union people correctly yet. And so I thought that. If I presented the idea to you gentlemen, and then if you felt like uh, uh, this might have some uh, implications, or at least some possibilities, uh, this might have to be modified uh, to suit the needs of everybody. Uh, I'd get names and addresses of the appropriate people to write to in your respective unions, and then maybe you might follow up with a letter yourself if you play, care to, uh, uh, saying that I've met with you all. In fact, I would write and say that I met with you all and uh, tried to answer your questions. Uh, there, there's, there's still some weaknesses there. You brought out one that's going to happen. A lot of company representatives and a lot of union representatives, <coughs> unfortunately, will just read the award itself mm -hmm. at last and not read the full text of it and say, that guy's way off base. Yeah. He, he, he's pro management. He goes without reading the whole text of it, uh, which. Uh, Sometimes uh, you, when you read the whole text, you can see that obviously uh, this was correct. Fair award, right. I haven't been in this field, of course, now for 12 years since, you know, I've been out of the local union and the business or the union grievances. But even when I was uh, uh, handling this thing, he had a tremendous job on occasions getting uh, an arbitrator that uh, was acceptable. And uh, getting one that wasn't just uh, acceptable, even if we got one that was acceptable, then the next problem was was getting a, a date set that, that he could be there on. Yeah. So, I mean, even back there then, there was a definite problem on the acceptable arbitrators that were not up to their neck could work, you know. Some of these guys, the case load is terrific, yeah. even back there then. And, and I'm sure it's worse today than it was then. You know, we should have had this guy over at that school. Yeah. Well, of course, what what we're going to try to do, if 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 the, if the committee uh, uh, wants to support the proposal, goes on record in support of it, uh, as he points out, there might be need to make some changes. But the idea is what I think that uh, we are supporting, and we would be supporting. And of course, what we would do from that point on is we began trying to set up meetings with other labor groups. Uh, and let him explain what, what he's trying to do, uh, you know, and try to build support for it, is, is our view of it. Now, we have this uh, organizing conference uh, every month that, uh, that I thought maybe I talked to Bob about inviting him to attend one of those and, and talk about the thing. This would be organized with international union people, it's a lot of them dealing with it. Directly with, with, directly the, with uh, <laughs> this problem. Uh, and, and I agree with you, Tom, that. Uh, you know, after I discussed this thing with him at the university, that was when I thought that we ought to have him down for this meeting. I have one other question. Uh, uh, is it your thought 
uh, that when uh, these people are trained, that this will be their field of, uh, uh, or will or will they just be uh, there to draw on, and they have to have some other profession for their well, livelihood? Well, only about ten percent of the people on the rosters do this full time. The others are people who are ministers, uh, lawyers, uh, university <coughs> professors, uh, or who do this on the sideline working maybe with a government agency and they do this on the sideline. Wouldn't you say that a majority of them come out of university? Is that large majority. Of them are large so. majority of them are out of university. Large majority, yeah. What, what's your experience, man, in terms of finding? Don't you find it yeah. most of them are with some university? Yeah, the university associated. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, in Southern Cal, one of them is university associated that has so many cases that he's down to teaching one third time. Yeah. And he's doing two third time arbitration. Last year, a survey was made by the American Arbitration Association, and 90% of the cases went to arbitration are heard by 10% of the certified arbitrator. In other words, uh, I'm going to have to go to the back. airport and pick up our other guest. Uh, Tom can continue conducting the meeting. If y'all got any further questions, uh, you can continue the discussion, and I'll leave this agenda with Tom, and if, if y'all get through before I get back, before we break for lunch, uh, he can go ahead. I mean, if you don't get through, uh, we can bring up you know, a matter that needs to and uh, I'll be back as soon as I can with the guy that's going to discuss the prescription thing. So y'all go right ahead with the discussion. In the, event, in the event, I don't see you. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, what, what's your schedule? Well, we're going to have a, a chicken served in the back. Uh, the girls are going to fix up a snack eat here in the building. We can't have to be on it. Okay? Y'all go right ahead. I, I, just I think this. they're going to have yeah. turkey hash. There's one other, I don't want to hog all the time here, but of course we took care of the, if the court suit, if this thing is adopted and in the process of setting it up, uh, wouldn't it be beneficial to the program, the overall program, <coughs> to solicit younger people uh, in in this in this thing, so that you'd have the benefit of more years of uh, longevity? Yes, sir. I think so. And there are an awful lot of young men that are getting their degrees in accounting. of the uh, university professors in this state, uh, you'd have at least a half a dozen that would give of their time and go to pay, pay, even pay tuition to go to one of these so that they could be certified by the board too. Quite a few attorneys would be interested. Yeah. Do <coughs> Dr. White, who used to be over at Mississippi State University, expressed a desire some years ago to me, uh, he along with other people to get on in a position Let me ask this. Uh, I, I noticed in this correspondence, I think, that some mention was made in this connection with the Federal Mediation Conciliation Service. Does that come into this picture? What, at what point does it come into this? The Federal picture? Mediation and Conciliation Service was established uh, with the Taft Party Act in 1947 as a separate agency housed in the Department of Labor but separate from the Department of Labor. And their job is to certify uh, people. And then when management and unions write a letter asking for a roster, they ha they'll send the roster as well as uh, the biographies of all of the people on the roster. And 
the partisan correspondence and service and the service support command and uh, they, so it's a federal agency uh, but an impartial one uh, they're dis disaffiliated with uh, any other agency so that they could um, <coughs> no one could, con could contend that they've been influenced by either group or any side they are the ones that uh, like to have this on a. They have some reservations about it. Um, Mr. Uh, Carroll, for example, said uh, this service shares your concern of the need for the training of young men so that they will be qualified to enter the field. Our experience is that the criticality of the situation grows with each passing year. We therefore welcome the opportunity to explore any new approach which may alleviate the problem and assure the continuation of one of the most effective tools in maintaining industrial peace. In a later letter, he states he has some reservations about it on a national uh, level. Um, and he says it wouldn't work, and I wrote back and said, uh, Ten years ago, if somebody had told you that we'd be landing on the moon, you probably would have thought that you put the insane asylum. To paraphrase the words of one who had been there, at least a joint meeting of management and labor representatives would be one giant step forward. Whether or not we succeed, we'd like to try it. He said, well, I still have some reservations as to your suggested approach. I nevertheless feel that this and other agencies who are concerned with the arbitration process should take an affirmative viewpoint and explore every suggested possibility for a solution of the problems flowing out of the current shortage of new blood on arbitration rosters. Mr. Kleberg is even, Kilberg, the new general counsel, is even a little bit more, uh, oh, what's the word I'm trying to find? A little bit more critical because it says because of the varying criteria as to what determines acceptability in different geographic areas of our nation, I feel that a regional approach would be most likely to achieve success. I agree. A regional training program would be the ones likely to achieve success. However, I think that a national committee would be the one to decide because if we leave out your union, for example, uh, completely and uh, and you start moving into that region, whether you necessarily accept somebody that uh, has been selected by somebody else and that you had no say in. I, I'm, so I'm suggesting that everybody should have a say. This is a thing that we've kicked around uh, a great deal, as a matter of fact. You know, some of your agreements uh, will specify a geographical area from which an arbitrator might come from. We've had this thrown at us many times, never agreed to it. But uh, being in Mississippi, and I feel sure that uh, there's a few other southern states in particular that uh, would concur in it, why pick an arbitrator from an anti-union state? Now, I could agree, and we do agree, that industry plays a bigger part than a geographical uh, location when you're uh, selecting an arbiter. Uh, and certainly uh, utility industry has their peculiarities. Uh, an outside line construction industry has their peculiarities over <coughs> inside uh, electrical work. Uh, communication work have their peculiarities. Marvin Taylor has some of all of them. <laughs> 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 Building trades and carpentry. So uh, to me this is a better association than a geographical or if that's what we're really talking about, geographical area. Well, as I've been told more than once, in fact, I was talking to my boss, who's uh, certified by the American Arbitration Association, but has never had a case. Said that never, no experience. Mm -hmm. He has a good labor relations background, good education. Well trained, took every confounded course that he could possibly take. Sam Nichols is well qualified as a man could be. I've <laughs> wrote him a long epistle, made two or three telephone calls, get him on the association. The first case here was IBEW and ruled against him. 
<laughs> well, you know, if the contract, if the contract yeah. was right. Yeah. <laughs> he actually didn't rule against us, but he so worded his decision until it meant nothing. Oh, wow. Well. That it was at Engel's shipyard. Another one of them things left you hanging. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and both union and management called the man or wrote the man and asked him for clarification of his decision. He wrote a clarification, and when they got through, they were in worse shape than they were when they started. <laughs> clarification is worse than the right. reason of the war. Right. Uh, uh, I think, really, this is what I've been trying to say all morning. They should be trained. They should be trained. They're now, Sam right. wanted to be called for another case. You know that. And he was afraid of uh, offensive decision to one of the other side. Oh, we've got a case so coming up now on the national level uh, that uh, we are arbitrating the arbitrator's decision. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Uh, uh, in mm -hmm. other words, the company refuses to abide by it and the union refuses to abide by it. She must not have said anything. <laughs> no, well, 17 pages or nothing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, but now, in other words, we, we asked somebody else to tell us what he said. What he meant. What are he meant. Other, are there other questions here from for Dr. Simon? We've got several items of business we want to have. I don't have it. Well, I, I think yeah. this, uh, Tom, in the way of a summary of what my thinking is, that uh, none of us really like to use an arbitrator, but it's a better of the two evils. And certainly when we have to use them, we want the most competent people that we can get. And I do think that it affords us an opportunity to uh, improve on the areas that are bothersome as far as both sides labor and management are concerned. Now then, the ones that would finish your course as proposed, would they be certified and registered with the American Arbitration Association or are you both. starting both of them? Both federal mediation right. considered? In other words, what I'm suggesting is that let's say for one week they're going to get history, philosophy, and the labor union movement for two hours a day. Uh, the different union representatives themselves could be the instructors. The selection of good spokesmen from different unions, each for 30 minutes maybe, giving them their history, their philosophy, or an hour. So that these men can understand something about the needs and wants of people and desires and what, what causes certain things to go into contract. You and I know that everything that goes into our contract is because either management feels a dire need for it or the union feels a dire need for it. And I bet you in your next contract, you all are going to be asking for certain things that have been standard practice, SOP, uh, for 15 years that you're going to be asking for it to be in writing from mm -hmm. now on. And so this is what Ben Fisher is actually saying. The, con the contracts are getting much more complex, especially with mechanization. Therefore, we can't take the chance anymore of just anybody becoming an arbitrator. Incidentally, one of the management representatives told me that they had tried a new man. They had come in the union and tried a new man. And this man walked in and he said, gentlemen, as you all know, this is my first case. Now, now what do we do? What mm -hmm. And here he was certified. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are we supposed words, to do? In other words, he asked the participants, what was he supposed to do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if we don't train them, 10 years from now, that's what we're going to get. Yeah, that'll that'll be the general practice. Yeah. That's right. It'll be the general practice because uh, the, the AAA is going to have to lower its standards and pick somebody with two re two uh, uh, recommendations from companies and two recommendations from unions instead of five. You don't know by the time it gets to the table, it's a little bit too late. You know. Yeah, you yeah. Know, sure it is. <laughs> so, uh, uh, my boss is... Uh, I told him what I wanted to do. He said, in an anti-union state like Mississippi, the legislation's going to crawl down your back. I told him, I said, well, if they, they crawl down, they'd crawl right back up again because uh, this is my field, and I'm supposed to be teaching labor management. And the name of the course, incidentally, a change. That's not where I want to go. And it's going to be a new book. It's going to be called Government-Labor-Management Relations, the first book, because the government now is an employer, right. Right. Very big. Yeah. and some of those school board, uh, not school board, not superintendent, but some of these school board members around this state are going to be probably after my neck, 
But as I told the academic vice president, I mean the vice chancellor, if uh, y'all get too much heat, let me know and I'll go elsewhere. Because I believe that every every uh, union and every employee and every company, uh, three, three parties, uh, should have in writing what personnel policy is, because that's what a contract is. Personnel policy is to be followed by everybody. I believe that the school board should have it, just like a company. I mean, that's just a, a matter. Of, and, and then if they misunderstand each other, uh, if the intent was not clear, uh, there's one way of resolving it, short of a strike, and that's to yeah. arbitrate. This is the only way you can have consistency. Consistency must be between the people. You can't treat one that way. <coughs> I, believe that another that another. I believe that Simon's uh, business here really is to answer our questions and also to get a decision from us uh, whether or not we are favorable to his proposal. Uh, and uh, from what I understand about it, and uh, not only he's going to ask us to furnish him some names of uh, representatives from our particular union who he might send copies of this proposal to. And if that be it, why well, I'd like to go on record as making a motion that, uh, that this body d uh, is favorable to Dr. Simon's proposal. Is there a second? I would second. Is there a motion to second is there any discussion on the motion? Not all in favor, uh, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. I have it. I even started to vote for that one. <laughs> uh, Gentlemen, thank you very much. One, one, uh, one uh, sure, any questions? Uh, 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 the finances of this thing, uh, I, see, I see that you uh, suggest that it might be a federal grant. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, any uh, thing, solid ground to stand on on that, or, do you, or is that just a uh, wishing out kind of someplace? Well, uh, I feel that the Department of Labor itself, in fact, I was told that the Department of Labor was had $72,000 earmarked to be spent in the South in the field of uh, trying to train uh, federal and state employees uh, for next year. And I feel that uh, with an executive committee and composed of representatives from eight of the large unions in the United States and the American Society of Personnel Administration uh, uh, all jointly going and making a request like this of the uh, uh, federal government that we get a grant. I'm on the, uh, there's such a need for it, yeah. especially if the AAA and the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service also jump on the bandwagon. Uh, however we don't, we might get one from Carnegie Foundation or Ford Foundation. <coughs> How fast do you think this thing will move to uh, uh, to a conclusion of uh, actually getting uh, somebody in training? Well, I had hoped that I, my ambition was to get something done and started this summer. But uh, if I'm on now, I'm going to, in order to be sure that every, everybody gets a fair shake here, I'm going to write to every international union, I'm going to write a letter addressed to everyone, and send a, each and every one of them a, a copy and ask them to give me some feedback as to when we'll be, uh, I, don't, I don't predict that we meet in Washington uh, in the Department of Labor building. I don't think that we'll be able to even have a meeting until March or April because it might take that long for each respective international union to agree. Uh, to they'll, they'll find some weaknesses on this, I'm sure, because uh, three heads are better than Two and two heads are better than one, and ten heads are better than uh, one. And all I did here was uh, think and think and think about all of the possibilities. And well, we can probably provide you uh, with some of the names of the uh, regional directors, the heads of the unions that uh, in this area. It's, it's already been pointed out. These are really the people that uh, are going to have to be uh, contacted. These are the people get the interest, the attention of the International Union officers in Washington. Yes, I'm afraid if I had to 
funds were to go to each region uh, and travel to go to each region and sell this idea uh, or I'm, if I use the word sell I don't mean it in a negative way I mean present the idea and answer questions like I was able to do here um, they, they'd be able to make more intelligent decisions uh, I think however it's going to take the national union support in order to get their grants. Yeah, there's no question it's going to take the, the influx of the national union, sure. Because, well, they have an influx. Well, Sarah, All can right. I tell them we're, we're chairman? Chairman. I'll, I'll, uh, and if any of you gentlemen, after I leave here, uh, if any of you gentlemen think of anything, uh, best letter to me, you have my name on the top of it, just address it, the University of Mississippi, University of Mississippi, and I'll get it, because uh, uh, I appreciate any ideas and the suggestions and the feedback that any people that y'all are in contact with, your respective uh, people might be, uh, might have some ideas. Uh, so I'll get a letter off to Mr. Sherman uh, immediately, and any other well, names. All right, all right, yeah, one uh, she can send you a letter with your name and address. Oh, on there. All right, I'd appreciate it very much. And I'll, all I can do is take time. And if y'all have any other questions or observations? Or Thank you. Can I just say, and and uh, eat lunch with us when we're going to do a journey to Clear Floyd on Sunday when we're going to read or something. Uh, yeah, okay. I always uh, take another ladder. I'm going to take a cup of coffee. Oh, oh, just, just make your sense at home. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. We've got 15 minutes. I guess we better go ahead with another item or two here. Brief uh, because I'm sure the drugs are going to take a little time and everybody's going to get through. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about the voters' league here just briefly since we met. Uh, as such, as a committee, uh, of course, you're a committee with the Mississippi Voter Registration Education League. We've been fooling with it now for several years, and of course, it was primarily organized to try to register uh, the black people mostly. Uh, the fraud and I, up to just recently, had only acted as, acted as advisors to the group. So um, it was appearance a few months ago that Aaron Henry, who was chairman of the thing, who was also chairman of the so-called lawyer of the Democratic Party, didn't really have any interest in the voters' league any longer, so uh, people began to contact us about the league, want to know if it was dead or if it was going to be revived or maintained or what have you. So we contacted <coughs> several of the leaders, including uh, Reverend Johnson, all of you remember him, gave the implication that I would who was first vice president under him. And um, we got a few people together here in the office. Uh, I think it was uh, probably September sometime. Uh, discussed the thing, and it was very apparent that there had to be a reorganization job done, and it would probably want to be done without Aaron. And as a matter of fact, somebody had talked to Aaron about it, and he more or less expressed the, the uh, same view that he didn't have the time to fool with. So a meeting was called to uh, reorganize the thing. And at that meeting, uh, temporary officers were elected. Of course, Johnson was elected uh, chairman, and Claude was elected first vice president, second vice president for administration for city employees, Bob Thomas. I was elected secretary, and Bob Woodson, member of our board, was elected treasurer. Uh, <coughs> to go back just a little, uh, the books, the secretary, uh, the books, uh, the organization uh, had all been kept out at the NAACP office out there. And uh, something uh, happened to all the funds. No, we don't really know how much money there was in the treasury, but one of the young ladies who worked out there in the NAACP office uh, admitted uh, taking the funds. And nobody don't really know. Some say it was $300, some say it was over 12 uh, In the absence of uh, records, so the secretary that really knew what was happening, uh, the whole business just disappeared. So 
Well, this was all explained to the people, and uh, so we uh, established a new bookkeeping system. We, of course, elected new officers, and uh, Bob Woodson has now uh, got a, an account open in the bank. Uh, this is the address for the league here. All the monies are sent to me, and I turn them over to him. He gives me receipts. Anyway, we have uh, reorganized the thing in the hope we can revamp the county organizations. There were 33 counties that had county leagues that were affiliated with the state organization. We're hopeful of uh, revamping all of those, and in addition to that, by early spring, trying to establish an effective organization in each of the counties. Now, we feel like this organization is essential. If we are to uh, work uh, through our, primarily through our black members uh, with the black community and if we are to have some, maintain some sort of coalition here that we've had in the past and uh, maintain any kind of influence with the people, we feel like this is the organization to do it. And of course what we're trying to do now is to make it a more of a biracial organization. The last meeting we had where we uh, <laughs> approved a revised constitution and elected permanent officers, which were the same, incidentally, as were temporary. Uh, it was the, the need to make it a more of a biracial organization was stressed. And we did have a few white people there, and of course, uh, we would like to encourage you folks in the area where there may be a county league to become active in it, and uh, any time you can, or any of the members that you have that become active in this state league, this is what we want because uh, we, we've got to exert more and more influence. We do have a number of the black trade unions working in the thing, but we do need uh, a more and more whites to get in this organization because there are those blacks that we're having problems with, as, uh, particularly Jim down in those working in these various OEO programs. There are more and more of these wild-eyed blacks that are moving in trying to take over these programs. And we have simply, as a matter of necessity, got to move to build a closer reli uh, alliance here uh, with the black union. All the <laughs> Texas calls on wild eyed philosophy that's moving in on us here. And incidentally, I might tell you, in connection with the Explorers League, there has been a, an A. Philip Randolph Institute organized in Mississippi. You'll recall uh, uh, Rustin speaking at our convention. And of course, the young, I don't know if he was in a man with him, his assistant in the A. Philip Randolph Institute has been back to Mississippi. There was a meeting, statewide meeting, of black trade union leaders. There was about 75 in the meeting, and this was the initial organization effort, and of course there will be shortly, we hope, regional meetings held throughout the state with Hill out of New York back in the state assisting Bob Woodson and organize an A. Philip Randolph Institute at the local level. Of course, all this is, as you know, is an uh, organization made up of black trade unionists to try to get people registered and to try to get them involved in the labor movement and expand their influence in the black community. So this is about where we are, and the voter league's uh, possibilities look much better. Uh, we've got, uh, usually, a good type of person involved in it, and uh, as long as we feel that we can uh, maintain this relationship with our black union leaders in the state. We feel like we can better combat some of this uh, other crap that moves in uh, these other programs here and there. So that's about where it's at. But what we do want to do is move to make it a more of a biracial organization because believe you me, we're going we're gonna to need all of the voting trends that we can muster in 1971. Are there any questions on this matter that you'd like to ask? Is there any conflict between the Voters League and the Philip Randolph Institute? No. <clears throat> Is there grounds for any? Uh, if both are trying to serve the same. Well, no, I don't. Uh, I don't think so, Jack. Uh, the the main difference here, really, uh, of course, in the A. Philip Randolph thing is strictly a trade union. And of course, your your voters' league is a trade union, and it's you know it's just in and everybody that shares uh, 
similar for uh, philosophy. And of course, we did uh, uh, move or take uh, make uh, one or two, uh, I thought, wise moves in revising this Constitution. It does specify now that it is a nonpartisan organization. And uh, people like Aaron Henry and Charles Edwards can't really move in now and take the thing over and turn it into some so-called democratic organization to feather their own nest. feel like that, uh, that it's uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, and we're, we're hopeful that there wouldn't be a conflict developed between the Philip Randolph and the voters there, but I don't believe it would. Uh, if we can maintain the same you know, line of thought that we've, we've got right now, of course, the day Philip Randolph thing that really got off the ground. It's just been just the preliminary <coughs> of state organization uh, help here, and of course there's considerable work, and that Woodson has his own work and his own organization, he owns so many boards and committees like the others, so it's awful hard for him to get around and, and do the leg work that has to be done. I'm hopeful that it will materialize. That was Charles Brown, he said that the plane would be about 30 minutes late. Uh, that's normal. Par for the course. Let's go ahead and <coughs> Are there any other discussion on this voters bill? We will try to keep you advised, you know, of, of these meetings, and as I say, we would appreciate no, anybody. No action that. required on it. It's no, not just that. a matter just of just to report. keep you uh, informed as to what we're trying to do. And uh, there, there's, we, we discussed this business of Claude and I, or any other whites for that matter, uh, you know, actually holding office, and then it was uh, the, the overwhelming. Uh, overwhelming opinion of the blacks that uh, we should and actually if we're going to try to see that this thing run right and not let it get off on the wrong road then we do need a voice in it so this especially if we're going to keep getting the money from the international union to pay for it is true. <laughs> and of course we do have the uh, do the, the, uh, the well, yeah, I feel <laughs> you see we, we issue certificates <laughs> to the county organization the county organization pays the state five dollars per year individual membership is two dollars a year the county league keeps one dollar and the other dollar comes to the state and i can assure you that whatever money is uh, collected in the name of them dues or what have you we will know where it goes from now on there wasn't no way time to get restitution out of the individual that made off of the funds wasn't, I, I they wasn't under bond or nothing uh jim uh, the way the thing was handled and of course we are partly to blame of course at that time, we didn't really have a vote. We were just sitting yeah. in with them, you see. But uh, Evers just took the thing over out there. And Henry is around at NAA. And we realized this was the wrong thing after it's really too late. And frankly, I th it would probably cost you more than you'd ever get out of it if you started. As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure if we got any evidence of any kind as to where it may have gone. It. You see what I mean? Is you, you get. Some say there's three hundred dollars in the treasure, and others say there's over twelve. And God knows, nobody don't know. But we've certainly learned the lesson from this. I guarantee you, it's going to be different now. Yeah, the officer of any of our locals made off of that much. They'd go to the penitentiary. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. this is true. But, uh, but that don't say <laughs> local union. There's, there's really, <laughs> there's really no way. Uh, you see, old man Smith was the secretary, was the treasurer. And they would get him to sign checks, you see, and they'd take those checks and mail them to Clark Bell, A, and Henry, and he'd <laughs> countersign them. And uh, they'd just done whatever they really wanted to do. So I send Henry and Evers a bill on telling the old 600 a piece. Yeah, that we should. Really. So it, it was a mess. I agree it was a very careless and wrong thing. But it's going to be a different now. There's one other thing I'd like to mention to you while we're waiting for lunch here. Um, Early last year, no, not last year, this year, seven, I received an invitation from a lady up at Mississippi State College for Women in Columbus to attend a meeting to talk about the possibility of organizing a consumer uh, organization of some type in Mississippi. I think the meeting was held perhaps in February and March in Hinesville. Well, I attended. There were about 20 people there. Most of them represented the Mississippi Home Economics Association. They were, uh, there was a guy there from the Mississippi Credit League uh, Federation, and uh, 
one or two school teachers, and that was about it. Anyway, we uh, kicked the thing around. Of course, we had one of Ms. Nowler, the president's assistant on consumer affairs field in uh, Cabanera. And uh, at that time, they appointed a committee to talk about, uh, further discuss the possibility of organizing a league or an association or something. And a meeting of this group was called for August 7th in Columbus. So I went by and Brother Taylor and I accompanied me over to this meeting. And of course, at that time, we set up another date. Uh, I believe it was October 17th for a meeting here in Jackson, which um, was held. And of course, uh, we had a proposed constitution. Incidentally, uh, Martin, this Ebersole, you know, from Mississippi State University, he's taken one of our constitutions had his secretary go through it, and wherever it mentioned the state AFL-CIO, he just put in association, the league. This was really key. He called me on the 16th of October. He said, hey, Tom. I said, yeah. He said, this is Lewis. He said, I just want to tell you tomorrow when that's read, not to raise your eyebrows, you'll recognize the whole thing. He said, we're going to make sure that it's got the proper guidance, you see. So lo and behold, uh, they, uh, I was late getting there, and they pretty well sold the whole thing out. But it didn't uh, fit, really. It really didn't fit, no. <laughs> he just done a real bad job and left. <laughs> anyway, uh, this meeting was held, and they ramrodded through some uh, uh, officers' uh, elections there, or temporary officers, and I got hung with the job of secretary. A guy from Delta State College, Dr. Eckhart, was named chairman. <laughs> and they elected a seven-member steering committee in addition to the president and the secretary. So that steering committee, uh, and incidentally at this meeting, we had Cavanera back for another appearance, and then we had Howard Frazier, who is president of the Consumer Federation of America. Now, you'll recall he addressed our, I believe, 66 convention in the place of Mrs. Peterson. He was her assistant at that time. And uh, he is now president of the Consumer Federation, of which the Mississippi AFL-CIO is a member. And uh, <coughs> we got good press coverage. The Channel 3 taped his address out there. We got a rather good article in the Sunday Clan Lady Daily News. And the steering committee has met once since that time, and we have drafted a proposed constitution. And we will meet again on December 11th to, uh, we've, uh, again, the committee has uh, changed its mind and we're redoing that proposal at the moment. We're going to have a constitution to submit to a meeting which we think will be called on January 30th. Now, at this October 17th meeting, there were about 35 people from the labor movement that were invited, and we had about five. And, of course, we're going to invite those again in addition to some additional people. And uh, since we don't have any mailing list to contend with here, or we don't have anything else to do, it looks like we've inherited this one. <laughs> so uh, we will be getting the correspondence out of this office, and I would appreciate very much for those of you that get the invitations. And even those that don't, if they can make it, you will have ample notice of the January 3rd meeting. At which time, if the people there uh, adopt the Constitution, we will be electing a board of directors. Now, if we're going to have a, a consumer organization, and incidentally the name is the Mississippi Consumer Association, if we're going to have it, we want to make sure that labor is adequately represented on this board of directors. And uh, I would appreciate it personally if we have a good delegation from labor at this January 30th meeting, which is on Saturday. Uh, and I think I think it's uh, we owe it to ourselves and our movement if uh, we're going to have the thing to help to see that uh, the Constitution is what we think it ought to be, and to help see that the organization is set up to do what it really should do. In other words, to see that justice is done at the marketplace. And uh, we're going to attempt to have Ms. Nauer, the president's assistant, present at this January 30th meeting. Get good press coverage. So uh, we we feel like maybe that we are on the road to, to having an effective organization here. 
But we do want as good a representative as we from labor that we possibly get. And I see this as a good political coalition here. It's, it's more uh, political allies here. And the thing that's been encouraging to me, and Marvin, I think, can testify to this, and Brother Jackson and I, who have been in meetings, is the attitude towards the representatives from labor. It's been real good ever since we, we first met with them. And they seem to uh, uh, really want labor participation. And I think that we owe it to ourselves and the folks we represent to really be there in full force. And uh, I may even talk Carolyn into being there and taking the minutes I have after that yet, yeah. but I'm planning to do it. <laughs> so if there's any questions yeah. like that, we did want to bring you up to date on. Now, what have we got left? Right? Along with consumers, council, uh, you know, my name was submitted to serve on this medical. Right. Then right. Word. Duration, what have you. I guess we could have been arguing until yeah, 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 uh, so. And of course, uh, when you go to adopt the final constitution, there's no, nothing to keep it from no, up again. True. It no, it's can be changed it's again. It's, it's, this is true. <laughs> this is right. So this is why we, you know, again, why we want you there, if you can be there. So. Uh, we got two more items there. I don't know how much time we got about this uh, booklet on the AFL-CIO program. And, legislative fund. Yeah, we've got a number of other things. So. You know, the, talking about that January 30th meeting, I saw you planning on having a board meeting sometime. Well, in my, in my time, both in the day. Well, we, uh, the other yeah, day, he and I finally decided on February the 6th <coughs> for the board meeting. Of course, it is going to be a shame to, to ask people to come in for Why? that and then turn around and come Why? back. I don't know. Oh, February the sixth. First this Saturday. is nothing official. Blanks. Right. So he just, uh, said the thirtieth. February the sixth. Oh, February the sixth. Yeah, that's probably. The first the Saturday in February. We may have to read. Right. It. There's nothing official. We may have Friday to. Friday or Saturday? Is it Friday or Saturday? It'll be Saturday. Mm -hmm. The sixth. No, the sixth probably. Oh, I know he's planning on having it on. He ain't having no board meeting on Saturday. Well, we've been talking about it, and it uh, seems to be the opinion of some be considerably cheaper. Mm -hmm. Have it on Saturday. I, I'm looking at seventy. And if February the sixth was on Saturday, then I'm one. I don't believe it'll be on Saturday in seventy one. But it's February sixth, first Saturday. Saturday. Well, I'll be. No, it's still on Friday. I'm telling you. Well, we may have to. It's on Friday. We discussed that further and yeah. think that thirtieth meeting. We're not sure about that. That's not official either. But we think it's going to be. Uh, um, there's one first other Saturday after Grand Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We might go ahead and uh, is Diane back? I told her to let us know when they okay. when they got ready. We might go ahead and, and touch on the affiliation thing. We've already got that listed here. Um, we are happy to report to you that affiliation is continuing to grow. We're over thirty thousand now, and uh, we have broke the ice with international woodworkers to some degree. If you will recall, we had for years we had about sixty or seventy members in Meridian. Well, now that particular local has dropped out. But we have affiliated uh, the local at uh, uh, Flora up here, Magnavox people, with 390 yeah. members. Uh, we have affiliated two other locals in Meridian. Claude got those both at one time in the same meeting. Now they're rather small. They've got about 10 or 12 locals in Meridian. Uh, we're told by the reps now, and incidentally, we had a, it is apparent that we are now getting some support out of Portland, Oregon, and out of Memphis that we wasn't getting prior to this. At the meeting in Meridian where Claude uh, spoke to the two locals and affiliated them, you had the assistant regional director and two international union reps, and they all three got on the floor and spoke vigorously in, in support of the state organization. It is a change. So well, this is a change. Uh, we have uh, we are told that the Vicksburg local is probably the next one to come in. It's over 400 people now. And uh, there is a slight possibility down the road of the Masonite local. They've been able to raise their dues. Uh, they've got uh, progressive leadership. And uh, we, feel, uh, we feel like that uh, 
there might be a possibility of that. But anyway, we are now working with an AFGE local in Biloxi, which has a potential of 2,900 members. They now have about 1,500. And they are now in the process of conducting a mail ballot. And uh, we feel like the chances are good there on affiliation. And of course, uh, the newer locals, we're getting all of them. You know, they're one of those as they start paying dues. Uh, we had a funny thing happen recently. Dog got a letter one day, I guess, from firefighters in Biloxi. And he took us to task, but good, about our unconcern, the unconcern of the whole labor movement uh, as to their situation. They've got a picket line. Nobody's struck. But the police and the firefighters have a picket line, and they pick the fellas that are off duty are picketing in the city hall, exposing the anti-labor tactics of the city officials. You know, the police weren't organized, but as of yet, George Meany has never chartered that international union, and frankly, nobody knows just where it's at. So the firefighters weren't affiliated uh, with the state organization. They've had a charter down there for some time. So this guy really took us to task. Well, I must admit that uh, that letter was received with something less than enthusiasm uh, since they hadn't affiliated him. So Claude sat down and pretty firmly uh, showed him where the back 40 was, so to speak. So just to, and sent him affiliation blank. Just two or three days later, we got a letter of apology and their affiliation, the firefighters' affiliation. And he admitted that he was new, that he said a lot of things know what he was talking about. He didn't really have the knowledge, you know, of the labor movement and what was a strike and what wasn't and <laughs> what could be expected from who to do what. So that resulted in us picking up a few members. <laughs> uh, anyway, as you know, we have, uh, of course, we've had a number of strikes and this has hurt our uh, income. Uh, for instance, over a thousand people in Natchez were out three months or better. And they are back now. Columbus is out now. OCAW in Columbus has concluded there. Yeah, they went back to work. But uh, anyway, with all of that, we uh, we're making some progress. And anybody that you run into that will, it's not affiliated. If they're interested, uh, if they. <coughs> you can make the meeting, we appreciate it. If it won't one of us, let us know. This is what it's all about, of course. Uh, we won't get the people in the organization. We've, uh, we feel like we've got some of the International Union people, as uh, I indicated about the woodworkers, that are now uh, working uh, in this direction that maybe hadn't been doing too much in the past. So, well, I made a meeting uh, last month about the uh, Union Park, and uh, they got a ballot in the field now, uh, electing a new officer, and also increasing the elected dues, and one of the uh, stipulations on increasing the dues is uh, to affiliate with the state body. I, I, I got that in, in, in on their ballot, and uh, so uh, they... Uh, if if the uh, dues increase goes, uh, you will get an affiliation from the sure. from the current CWA local. Sure. And while we're at it, if we take another minute or two, Madam Secretary, it's a um, direct connection with in, this uh, with this uh, affiliation thing, and I think this is one of the things that we we've talked about in a long time. We got this in the mail. This is from West Country. I'll pass it around in a minute. Let each of you look at it. We've been thinking about some type of brochure to use particularly in this affiliation work. People, you know, say, well, I don't know what the state organization is or what it does or anything about it. So I sat down here one day and started to work just at random, uh, using this as a guide with a few things in mind. I roughed out uh, what I thought would uh, make a pretty good brochure. Claude taking it, he did some to it. Ms. Phillips has worked on it some. And we propose to take this uh, uh, material we've got here and carry it to the printer and come up with something similar to this. 
We'll have some pictures. Of course, Robbie, I'll let you take it. You got to pass it around. And of course, we want to bring it up with, uh, to you and get your approval. But uh, we feel like it. We, we just uh, got to have something similar to that, which kind of outlines the functions of the state organization and puts it in sections your legislative section, your political education, and then your public relations related program. So, as you all approve, we propose to. Spend a little money that we don't have in preparation. <laughs> Get around Shopping the Baptist Church. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Try to entice them. I wish pictures. you hadn't have brought that. <laughs> 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 Hitting too close to home this morning. Yeah. It's not even mornings anymore, is it? Uh uh. Well, I'd ask you while you were looking at that book of what you all think or thought of our certificate of affiliation. Right. Once you got the date right. Oh, I think the people just appreciate it. I, I just yeah. took that and put it in the typewriter. And, uh, appreciate like, it. Like Robin's brought his back and had me redo it today. That was neat. Oh, you took have done the same. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, not all of it. You want to be part. sure and get that door no, leaked. Yeah, we got to get that <laughs> face and north and south, Jack. <laughs> Did you put your Don't make a whole lot of difference. Oh, <laughs> no. man. Did you put your date? Your date? Didn't you get your note? Did you date wrong? I know it was. Because I've done wrong when all, all everybody that was in with the merger got the wrong dates put on it. I'm going to wait. Because we had mis, mis informed and screwed or something on the date. We have to load that for the longest. And then I got it wrong. I'm going to wait and let the chairman pass out the McKinley literature. Oh, I'm going to wait. I didn't use literature. I looked over here. He's just going to give something out. Some of the old that he's had about it. He's been saving that's what he was going to give out money for. <laughs> well, I just want to inform you. McKinley bumper Mr. stickers? Mr. McKinley has been badly mistreated down in Pasadena. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, with the construction that they did on the new yard, some guy made some slanderous remark over there a few days ago about the unions, and uh, Mr. McKinley uh, called his hand. They were got in a fight about the deal and both of them got fired. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Lord. <laughs> well, the better watch. He'll be up here after him then. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I don't know if he does. He, he said he thought he was worth saving. We owe him. I remember that. I want y'all to tell me what that is he hauls on the back of that pickup truck, so I couldn't make it out of that letter. <laughs> oh, <I laughs> that know, first man. letter, he said he was going to put something on the back of a yeah. pickup truck, but I never could make out what oh, it was. I read that truck. I'm watching him down there riding around the Cadillac. You're kidding. Yeah, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Well, Paul wrote the president, you know, the plumbers, yeah, and asked yeah. with the, we hadn't heard word of one. Yeah. Mm. They probably can't do nothing with him either. I don't know what happened. Well, well let me ask you this. Like where, where, where is he, Robin, where, where is he getting calling that something on a truck? I couldn't make Can you answer that one? Well, he's just a joke. Oh, yes, we sir. have it. Certainly it's just a joke, but... Uh, I'm talking about down there with his own call of uh, fellow worker thing. Well, the poor fellow, why didn't, why didn't he... Uh, under an institutional care is what That's I That's a good question. I mean, uh, poor fellow needs help. Right. Help that, that letter I seen, he, he had three different addresses on it. He had Laurel, Does Mississippi, he, he had uh, somewhere in Pennsylvania and sure somewhere in Tennessee. <laughs> well, does he have a family? I don't know. He's got a wife one time that we talked to, and she said she never had yeah, heard you, of Yeah, you you talked to her one time. Yeah, then. she hadn't heard from him in how long? She didn't know where yeah, He was gone then. Yeah, what? he was up north. You know, you had a wife at one time, and that's been a long time. He that probably doesn't know more. That was the uh, last mm -hmm. governor's race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's long. Yeah, I got quite a kick out of it. He thought Paul was worth saving. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read that stuff. Yeah. I can't read it. I could make it all out except that whatever it was he was going to put on that truck. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any uh, are there any discussion uh, on this the book of Brother Edwards? Uh, the there, yeah. Don't know, Robbie. They don't have any you idea. You know, see it we just see, I saw it, but I forgot it now. Oh, it 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 some I never could make form. out just what it was. He got on that truck. Which paragraph? It was. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> the only <laughs> one he had, I guess. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Society on yeah, well, well you gotta start truck. back here. You gotta start right by right here. Well, I want to make this statement clear. Again, we will keep uh, our H O U R of grievance in the our organizations until. <coughs> question: uh, Robbie just asked the question. We had any idea what the cost might be, and uh, we don't at this time. Or what we thought we'd do with your approval would be so. Uh, submit our uh, rough work here and along with pictures to the printer and let him rough out one and and uh, you know let us look at it again see if there's any changes needs to be made and then get an estimate on what it would take. They charge you so much a page based on the size yeah, you yeah, paid and right. what you put on it but I don't, I've got no idea what it'll run. First couple hundred would cost you pretty dearly. Yeah. Yeah, after yeah, that, yeah, after that, that get cheaper. Yeah. 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 Thing. Well, I mean, will we print enough for all unaffiliated locals, or well, where will it go to? Well, of course, um, uh, probably the board. Maybe. We need enough, board. you know, to have them on hand when we go out and talk to these unaffiliated organizations to make uh, lot, to make them available. I think we probably need to get at least a thousand copies, probably at least a thousand. Well, it might be done at the public relations. Um, I think a lot of the schools and all yeah. they write stuff. So you know what right. we do. Of course, that again, the cost will, you know, determine how many we get. Of course, the more you get, why well, the cheaper you get. Tell me, I make a movie. We eat. That reminds me of. Uh, well, we I think I'll put that up. We eat. Come up with cold. Yeah. I think we should uh, explore the idea of, I guess. Go ahead and rough in the Yeah, that's right. I agree. In other words, you, you, you move that we pursue the, the uh, sure. brochure. Right. Yeah. Okay, is there a second to that? Second. Any discussion now? Not all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The ayes have it. One other item of business here was the uh, I think Claude's got uh, one or two legislative matters he wanted to mention. Uh, we'll save that for him. But what I was trying to do is simply cut this down as much as we could because I know you folks have things to do and we've got other things we need to try to make count here. Um, you recall the resolution that was adopted at the convention, resolution number five, I believe, on the special legislative fund uh, along with, of course, our co program resolution number four. Um, we didn't send out the resolution on the uh, legislative fund after the convention for simple reason that uh, we realized there was a number of uh, requests going around. Uh, there were a number of strikes. We had made uh, numerous requests on local. We didn't feel like it was uh, the smart thing to do at that time because people were being called on to contribute to this, that, and the other, and certainly we want as good a response as we can possibly get when this goes out. And uh, as I recall, there was a deadline in the resolution of April 1st. I think we called on all the local unions to respond uh, with at least a dollar a member. Uh, by April 1st, 1971. Of course, uh, what we wanted to do was get your views on uh, when you think we uh, should send these. I think we need to send the two resolutions, the program we adopted, and then, of course, the other things to finance. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> try to get the response started from the request and uh, also, we wanted to talk uh, just a little bit about the uh, schedule for next year. Of course, we've already discussed some that, uh, in passing this board meeting, and here are some thoughts that we had had. 
wanted to mention to you was the possibility, of course, of a meeting of the full board sometime after the first of the year. We've also discussed the possibility of, a, of having a joint meeting of the central body officers come in with the board and also a meeting of representatives of international unions. Now, the reason for this was course is to talk about our activities in the campaign. Uh, to back up just a little, we have been promised considerable help financially and otherwise by national coping that I think there's only three states in this country that elect all their officials next year. And I think this is an advantage for us because <coughs> I'm sure that there'll be more money and more uh, assistance available. Uh, we've uh, been told that we would submit a budget uh, latter part of this year, the first and next, that uh, they were hopeful or felt sure that we could receive a certain amount of registration funds, a certain amount of the voter identification funds. And, you know, we, we, we're becoming modern. It used to be uh, card file, W-A-V <laughs> word, now it's voter identification, it's no longer card file, <coughs> uh, they call it uh, voter identification now. I understand they've, uh, they've got a, a fund for that program and then there's a fund for uh, registration and then there's also a get out the vote fund, they got three different funds up there and uh, the gentleman who's been handling the voter registration that was out of your union, Roy Purdy, yeah, assured us retired, in New Orleans. Yeah along with Al Barkin, that uh, come next year that Mississippi would uh, receive uh, <coughs> special attention and that we could expect the maximum uh, financial assistance. And, uh, so what we uh, will have to do is submit a budget on a voter identification, registration, uh, get out the vote program. Hopeful that uh, we can receive maximum assistance of course in doing this so we're expected to uh, put forth uh, a certain amount of money ourselves and I think of course that we have showed uh, uh, that we want to help ourselves by the fact the convention adopted the legislative fund and I think the quicker that uh, probably we get the resolutions out and make the formal appeal the better off we'll be with the people in Washington what are your, some of your thoughts on this uh, uh, joint meeting uh, between the central body officers and uh, the full board to talk about our activities and possibly a meeting of uh, representatives of the International Union or you feel like uh, maybe we ought to split them up? What, what are some of your thoughts on this? Uh, well, it's my opinion. I think we ought to have uh, one one meeting one. at one time, yeah, and if it takes a little bit more time, that would still uh, say uh, save a little time in uh, going back and forth. Yeah. There. Uh, 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 so I, I would suggest it all in one day. I'd rather do it all at one yeah. meeting. Yeah. yeah. And become well, three separate days. Well, they originally talked about calling the board <laughs> meeting for the month of January, and then it occurred to us that the central body, see, still most of them elect officers once a year. Some of them are changing over to the two years some of them have it. And uh, whether they elect them every year, in some instances, the new officers that we'll, we'll be working with next year uh, won't have taken office until sometime in January. So now this is the prime reason that we're now discussing a board meeting for February to make sure that, you know, that we've got the current central body officers because uh, it wouldn't do us any good to be meeting with people that's going out of office. And then again, with reference to the International Union representatives, uh, I was, it was real interesting over at the Southern Labor School last week, two weeks ago now in Wilmington, North Carolina, to hear the people from the states that have just gone through these elections uh, make their reports. Uh, it was, it was uh, interesting to note that in every one of them, <coughs> every state that made a report where they had elections, which was nearly every state there except Mississippi. They talked about the part that the international union reps played in the overall campaign. 
and uh, what it amounts to is this, that the state organization, uh, with the assistance of national coal, had been able to secure from nearly every union at least one person in the state or in the area from the staff of that union, of course, depended on how many the union had and whether or not they could, you know, how many they could spare for any given time. But nearly every state that I heard report, uh, they talked about the uh, genuine cooperation they had received from the international union and the number of international union people that had been donated to the state council full time during the election. So this is something that we want to look into and try to take advantage of over here if we possibly can, because we're 11 central body districts here, and of course, as you all know, the, the legislative races in the various areas are handled through the central body. But what we are going to have to have in a campaign is enough legwork people, enough full-time people to help us coordinate all of these activities, because one or two people just sure can't be in, you know, 11 to 12 places <coughs> all at one time. And it's, it's awfully important to have somebody where they ought to be when they ought to be there. So this uh, this is something that uh, we want to give uh, considerable consideration to is assistance from the union. I'm sure we'll get the cooperation. Of course, a lot of them don't have the staff they really need, but uh, where they do have it available, I'm sure that uh, they'll make them available to us. to get a meeting with these people and of course with a central body officer um, as early as we possibly can. Tom, uh, as far as the campaign itself is concerned, the question, the way I understand it, hasn't been fully decided yet uh, about when you're going to have a campaign in Mississippi. Well, it looks now, it looks now, E.V., like it, the, the new open primary law will stand. Yeah. Well, has it been ruled on? Well, the Attorney General, I put it this way, the last, I think this is the way the article read last week was, he still hadn't found anything wrong with anything contrary to the Voting Rights Act. Now, he really hadn't approved of this thing, but according to the news, he still hadn't found anything wrong, and they say they think it will, uh, you know. They also, also did it say that uh, if they filed against it, it would be by a certain deadline. Yeah, November right. And added all now, somebody days. tells yeah. Claude that uh, they think there's going to be a suit filed or a contest in the thing, but uh, yeah. nobody don't know, you see. And this, this, this is bad. Well, I didn't have a personal information about this. Keep us yeah. all fouled up. What we've done is make two reservations with the Coke Convention in Jackson. One, uh, under the old law, it would be Saturday, June the 5th, 4th or 5th, I don't recall at the moment. And the other one would be Saturday, August 7th. So either way, you know, it would be about the 60 days prior to the election. The schedule will usually follow. <coughs> we'll cancel out the one we don't, we don't need. But it looks now like we're going to be uh, having the election in October. So this means we got more time. <laughs> well, in regards to the legislative fund, uh, since we do have a resolution passed for a convention, I would suggest that uh, uh, the sooner after the first of the year that uh, you can get this uh, in the hands of, uh, of the locals uh, and uh, and let them uh, dispose of it, well, they, the better off we'll be. I would say in January. Mm -hmm. First thing, huh? Yeah. Does everybody concur in this? What does that say? The special legislative fund, the resolution number five, you recall? It's the dollar per member. Convention. Dollar per member. Dollar per state per legislative yeah. program. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the political campaign, really, is what it is. See, the reason we call it legislative fund, we already have an account. It's, uh, this is more or less a continuation of that. It authorizes four and five, I may have them backward, but in other words, the other resolution is our political
collect it so we can prove that they were required to do it. Yeah, when we have arrived. When, when the meeting oh, okay. you wanted to mention, we talked about yeah. the fun and the mm -hmm. meeting. Have uh, you got everything pretty well out of the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know thinking. some of y'all <coughs> operating on a tight schedule also now. Some of y'all. There's some of that stuff. That is something else on legislative. You want to talk about Not anything really important. I wanted to get the news on things. Oh, it is. This man has got a, a flight at seven something, and a standby at two forty eight. And I told him that I felt like if we could get right into this, that uh, we might get him back to the airport in time to get the standby flight. I knew some of y'all had uh, uh, some meetings, business that you had to get on to anyhow. So Roger, we're gonna. We've already mailed out the brochures. Everybody's pretty well familiar with what we're trying to do. We wanted you to come in and uh, give us, some, you know, the meat of the thing. And then, uh, if anybody's got any questions, we want to afford them an opportunity to ask questions. Now, I've already advised them of the program in Kentucky and things of this kind. So let's see if we can get you a chair. Here's, here's, here's a chair right. for him right here. Is it <laughs> extra chair? No. no, no. no. Getting this in while Why don't you go around and ask my seat ahead of the, the table, table right right where you can look at everybody? Seat is just over the Christmas, Christmas bill, tax pay, and the Whether this within what we do, what we do, help yourself, Carol. I believe I will, don't you know I will? We asked if they respond by April 1st, I think. I'll take green. I don't care what color it is. You like green? Have one, Tom. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. What color do you want? I don't know what I think. White always looks good. I, I, I shot that and uh, uh, copies of Sam's letter and the, and the cards and some other stuff that we, we've mailed out. That gives you some idea of the different... Basically, it's all the same, but it's the different literature that we've used in uh, Missouri and, and also the letter that was sent out in the car that was issued by uh, Sam in uh, Louisville, which will also be used statewide in Kentucky, but right now we have three stores that are in Louisville in operation, and that was the issue that was sent out before that. And just briefly, I'll explain that the facts brochure, which you've probably already seen because it's, it's basically the same. I stuffed some of these in the, uh, the kits this morning. What we do is when we go in locally into an area and open up, we usually take the same fact sheet on the back of it, we print up, and I think those are the ones from Minneapolis-St. Paul, I'm not sure. We print up the store locations. If there's one store or two stores or three stores, we usually print them up. We do one of two things. Either we can send this out with the initial mailing to the union member and his family, or uh, as we did in Louisville, we just simply put them in the stores and have them available if somebody came in and wanted them because we wanted to keep the mailing down to as, as few pieces as possible and also have it entirely around the, the drug program. So what we did in Louisville is made up a special envelope from the state AFL-CIO office. We had the letter that you, you have a copy of there and the card that we made up specially and then also the free prescription coupon that was sent out and that was the extent of the mailing that was made. Same with the scholarship brochures there. We make those available to the local unions and we have them in, in, on display in the stores or the union halls. But other than that, we didn't make a mailing on those either because we thought, that, you know, you get involved in a local area where you possibly sent out five or 6,000 or, as in Louisville, maybe 30,000 of them, and uh, you end up spending a lot of money to print them up, and they go to a lot of homes where they possibly don't even use them. So we decided it would be best on that information to simply distribute them to the local union offices and let them make a display board up if they <coughs> want or have them on display or have them in the store so that if somebody wants one, they're available. And then Sam ran some articles in the uh, newspaper about the scholarship program, and you'll be running that on a periodic basis. But as far as the program itself is concerned relative to, to and I'll get into the background, but as far as distribution is concerned, what we really need, and about the only thing that really we get involved with is that the small card that you see on, on the letter that Sam sent out, the special identification card, and that 3x5 card, which is a free prescription. What we do is when we open the stores, if state law allows it, uh, we give away a $5 free prescription. 
that's good for 60 days. We actually started out with that as a, a 30 day come on, but we decided that not a 60 days because we find that in too many cases, uh, with the mailing going out, if you get some local union send it out on time, others may send it out a week or two late. In Louisville, we went through the whole thing was done through the council, but if you can't do that, we've extended the thing for, for a period of 60 days now because too many times if you get it out a week or two weeks late and it's only 30 days, you might have some of your members who refill the prescription today, got the mailing possibly this coming Friday, and they're not ready for a refill for 30 days. So that uh, uh, the time period that you've got on the card is restricted to a 30-day period. The only time it's going to really be good is for short-term medication or if somebody just happens to get it the same day they're ready for a refill. So we've extended that to a 60-day period now, which gives everybody ample time to take advantage of, of the free prescription. But to give you some background on, on the organization, it got started in the latter part of 1963 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And at that time it was set up, there was one store that was set up, and it was initially set up uh, in conjunction with the senior citizens of department of the UAW, the retired workers and senior citizens department of the UAW, they have a regional office in Milwaukee, and also with the National Council of Senior Citizens. Uh, those two organizations locally were looking for some sort of a drug program for their retirees or the senior citizens primarily. And what happened is that in Milwaukee and in Detroit for quite a few years we've had what are called union toy centers. And what these are is uh, they buy all kinds of toys in large volume. They open, they rent supermarkets, old supermarkets or old warehouses. They put up all those toys on display and they sell them at a very low markup. But it's a closed door operation. If, you, if you're a union member or, or a family of a union member, you can get into the store. If you're not, you can't come in the front door. They're open six weeks prior to Christmas and three weeks after. <coughs> and uh, so when they got involved in looking for a drug program, they, they shopped around, they checked with Walgreens, they went to Rexall stores, they went to Independence, and nobody would come up with any kind of a legitimate program other than giving them 10% off if they show their card. But they wouldn't at the same time sit down and say, well, we'll give you 10% off and we'll also show you. The main thing they wanted is they wanted to be able to see the books. They wanted to be able to see what the drugs are purchased at and what they're selling for, what percentage of markup they're working at, so that when they send a retiree into the store or a senior citizen into the store, the guy would know legitimately what he's getting 10% off on. In other words, it wouldn't be a question of a guy coming in and shows the card and gives him 10% off at whatever price he wants to pick. Well, they weren't successful at doing that. And so what happened is that they then went to... Uh, one of the fellows that, or the fellow that ran these union toy stores and asked him if he knew of anybody that would be capable to get into this field and, and set up some sort of a drug program. And uh, that's really how it got launched. So they found a druggist, they set up a store in 19, about the latter part of 63, it was a downtown location. It was for senior citizens and um, retirees of, of organized laborers, National Council of Senior Citizen Members. And the way it was set up was that they would recommend their people come to the store on the basis that they would be able to, number one, see what the pricing are going to be, the standpoint of what the purchase price is going to be, and the books would have to be open to these organizations at all times. The same with the stores, as far as the stores are concerned, what was being used in the store. It was agreed at that time that they would work on overall profit of 32%, in other words, a 32% markup over wholesale price overall on all the items carried in the store. They decided that they did not want to carry in the store things like aspirin, uh, not aspirin, aspirin, but things like cough medicines. Uh, uh, they, they had cough medicine, but they didn't want to have things that were not health related like toothbrushes, toothpaste, minnow buckets, things that you find in a lot of the drugstores nowadays. They restricted the drugstore to specifically prescription drug items and what we call health related items, aspirin, aspirin, cough medicines, medicated salves, things that don't require a written prescription by the doctor but yet are used in conjunction with a sickness of some sort. Uh, it was also set up at that time on the basis that there would be no deliveries and there would be no charges on it. So the two reasons specifically for that was because the program that was set up initially was set up on the basis that they wanted to give the lowest possible price on prescription drugs to the membership that were coming in. At that time, as I say, it was retirees and members of this National Council of Senior Citizens. And whether you advertise uh, on the basis of free deliveries or not, we all know that there are extreme costs that are built into the price of prescription drugs to offset the cost of, of deliveries. There's no such thing as free deliveries. That was one reason why they wanted it kicked out because they didn't want to jeopardize the program from the standpoint of increasing the drugs to all people for 
the few that would possibly use a delivery. But to offset the fact that there were no home deliveries, they established a mail order business whereby you could send your prescriptions in through the mail, you'd pay the same price as anybody else, except that whatever the postage was in the container, you'd have to pay that. If it was six cents for one prescription or if it was 18 cents for three, you would have to pay the additional postage, which would really be cheaper than going down on the bus or the streetcar at that time to get the drug. They didn't get involved in the charge account in the program either for the reason that uh, whether it be uh, what they call family planning in a drugstore or whether it be a Bank of America card or First Wisconsin or something to that effect, it runs anywhere, I think it's now anywhere from 4 to 6 percent that is paid for that. So in other words, all the frills were taken out of the program. It was a program that was set up initially to give the lowest possible price on prescription drugs for their membership. Within about six months after that store was open, they, they moved out of that location. It was a downtown location. And it has since expanded to the point where we have now about 44 stores in operation. We have them primarily, most of them are primarily in, in, in around the state of Michigan and the state of Wisconsin. We have uh, four in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. We have three in Kansas City, Missouri. We opened two in Des Moines, Iowa last week. Uh, we have one in Waukegan, Illinois. There's one in Brockton, Massachusetts. There will be stores in, uh, more stores in Illinois, more stores in Minnesota. We're also going into Kansas, Oklahoma. We would hope to come into Mississippi. And we'd also like to go into Texas. Now these are the, these areas where we are in now, where we plan to go in would be within the next year and hopefully to have up 100 additional drugstores at the end of the time. When we started the program out initially, all the stores were owned and operated by Union Prescription Drug Centers. About six months to eight months ago, <clears throat> because of the shortage in pharmacists and the problems in getting pharmacists for this type of a program, we went into franchising of the drugstores. And very simply, it's really a matter there of the local pharmacist now is an owner operator. He owns the business and he's really working on a percentage of gross sales for his net income or his income as against working on a salary basis. We went to that because of the problem in getting pharmacists, and we found that it's been very effective. We can now go in and we can open up a lot more stores in a lot more areas because we can now offer a good franchise program where local owner-operator pharmacists can franchise the store. Uh, they can operate the store with one <coughs> pharmacist and a clerk, a full-time clerk or, or two full-time clerks, up to about 160 to 180 prescriptions a day. At that point, if they go further than that, they have to hire another pharmacist. But we found that it's an ideal situation because you can get, it's a one-man operation now. You can get him in there and he can run. Most of the stores that are in operation right now uh, are one-man operations. They can bring in a part-time fellow if they want, but they can generally mostly run the store by themselves with their clerk's help. Uh, so that's the reason how we've gotten into franchising and, and from the standpoint of all the stores that are put up, they are now on a franchise basis. We do have controls in our franchise agreement uh, to more or less hold a club over the franchisee's head from the standpoint of his pricing structures, from the standpoint of the quality of the drugs he must use, and from the standpoint of how his overall operation is run. All the drug stores in the warehouse are, are union, they're all under union contract. That's a condition of the franchise agreement. Another condition of the franchise agreement is that he must maintain the pricings that we establish, and these are established based on our volume buys. He has to buy through the warehouse and maintain either our quality and our price, or he can go direct to a local wholesaler, but he must be able to maintain either the same quality and the same price as we have, or the same quality and a lower price. In other words, if he can't buy for better than what we can buy, he then has to legally go through our warehouse. He cannot buy from small drug manufacturers. All the drugs that are carried, all the items that are carried in the store are only from the national drug houses, the big drug houses. All the national brands are carried. Um, we also come in the area, we sign the prime lease, it's a five-year lease with a five-year option, so that we have a prime lease seat. So when we come in we're, in, we're into this operation for a minimum of five years. We completely uh, finance the setup of the store. Each store, I would say, on the average right now runs uh, the initial investment to open the door is about $80,000, which we pay for. And the franchisee signs a long-term note, a five-year note, which is repayable over a five-year period, and that's how he repays the, the money that goes back. And he's doing that based on a percentage of gross sales in the store. Uh, most of the items that we carry in the, in the drug stores are warehouse biased in Milwaukee. 
as we expand these operations out and we open up more stores, we're going to have sub warehouses set up, probably a sub warehouse somewhere in the south, or thinking about setting up another sub warehouse, possibly in Philadelphia or somewhere in the state of Pennsylvania, which will service more of the stores that are going up on the east coast. And right now, we don't really have any plans to go way out west to California, but primarily now we're going to be concentrating on a line really from Wisconsin and Michigan straight south and then across to the, to the west to the east coast. Uh, as far as the, the <coughs> drugs are concerned themselves, what we do is we still work on a 32% markup over, over wholesale price overall. That includes not only the prescription drug items, but also the aspirin, the aspirin, the, the whole ball of wax. So that's the maximum that we're, we're working on. Now, there's a number of items that we, uh, we more or less juggle around to, to get this. And what we do is we come into an area and we'll take the top 30 selling prescription <coughs> drugs. And all of those will be competitive on price. In other words, we'll work on 32% over wholesale or less to be competitive. On all items where the wholesale price of the drug is $8 or more. In other words, if you got a prescription in the wholesale price, our actual cost on that prescription is $8 or $30 or $50. You pay a dollar and a half over our cost. Now that's like a fee schedule. In other words, if a guy comes in and wants a guy to buy a six-month supply of thyroid tablets, and let's just say that uh, those thyroid tablets, six-month supply, cost us $30 wholesale, he'll pay $31.50 for that prescription. If it's a prescription that costs us wholesale eight dollars, you'll pay nine fifty. <coughs> we use that breakoff point so that actually, when you talk about thirty-two percent, we're really not working on thirty-two percent on the bulk of the prescriptions that are sold because we're working on a dollar and a half. But that is offset by non-prescription drug items plus the prescription drug items, and then a lot of your prescription drug items that are very, very seldom used and are what we call short-term medications. So in those cases, we'll be working on a thirty-two percent between that. So a dollar and a half fee on wholesale over eight dollars plus the front end material, the non-prescription items, we come out with a we work on a maximum overall 32% markup on the on the price of all the items in the store. But the primary savings you're going to find in this type of an operation is, as Claude may have indicated to you, he's found with with Sam is that it's going to be on prescription drug items. It's not going to be on your front end items. Now we carry aspirins and addisons and vitamin pills and all these. And we discount those a flat 20% off a of retail price for, for anybody that comes in the store. Now, when I say anybody, I'm saying any union member that comes in the store, any associations or anybody that's set up on the program. But you're going to find that on a day-to-day -day basis, those are going to be good prices. But they aren't going to be good prices on a day-to-day -day basis when you have, for instance, maybe, I don't know what stores you have down here, but you may have a large department store that's going to shoot a special on on one of the uh, chewable vitamins. You might have another store that's going to shoot a special on aspirins or anisins. Uh, uh, we don't get involved in that for the simple reason that everything is set up so that we're working on a really a, a price structure of 32% over cost and we've got everything discounted. We're down to where we can possibly work on the lowest discount and, and still make out. And we can't get involved in shooting specials. Now the reason for that is because if you shoot a special today on, on Bayer aspirin You've got to make it up someplace else tomorrow because in our operation, for instance, we have to do a volume of 100 prescriptions a day in the store to break even. That's the break even point in, in our type of an operation. So you have to have high volume and low markup and low overhead. That's really what it amounts to. So you're going to find that when the people come into the store, every day they're going to find the discounts on the front end material. Every day they're going to find low prices on the prescription drugs. But on a day-to-day -day basis, for those areas where you're going to find stores, and I don't know how many you got down here that do that, but up where in Milwaukee, for instance, in Detroit, where you have a lot of discount houses and a lot of big chains, you find that these are their big come-ons. You know, all the front-end material is the stuff that they shoot the prices on. And we don't get involved in that. We don't run special. For instance, you might come in and you, you'll find that when we sell insulin, we usually sell insulin just to maybe 10 cents above our cost or 20 cents above our cost because in most areas it's a very competitive item. Uh, the same with Maalox. That's a very competitive item. But uh, one example of that is that most of your Walgreens stores on a national basis use Maalox as one of their lost leaders. In other words, they sell a bottle of Maalox at possibly 10 cents a bottle less than they pay for it wholesale. And that's what they call a lost leader. Of course, they make it up on something else. But as far as our operation is concerned, we don't get involved in those items because whether it be a meat market or a large chain store, if it's a lost leader item on the front end, they're going to make it back up on the on the prescription. 
I can only say this to you, as far as overall pricing is concerned, there is no one drugstore nor, nor any chain nationally that we've run across anywhere, and I think Detroit and Milwaukee are probably the two most competitive areas that can beat us overall on price of prescription drugs. There's just nobody that can. We have uh, our volume buying is, is done for all the drugstores. Most of your chain stores do not do that. Even, for instance, your Walgreens stores, they will buy all the front-end stuff that has their own brand name on it, like Rexall, for instance. They buy that stuff in, in large volume, and they warehouse it, and they can get it very, very cheap. But as far as prescription drug items are concerned, the individual store manager has the option of ordering <coughs> his drugs as he needs them in the store. So therefore, he's reading the position that if he's not doing more than 30 or 40 prescriptions a day, he's paying the same wholesale price as your small independent drugstore is paying for his prescription drug needs. Now, there are numerous cases where I can quote you prices where our wholesale price is below, or our selling price is below the, the Red Book wholesale price for independent drugstores. In many cases that we have it, I can quote you on. Um, as far as setting up stores in a particular area, uh, we normally can't go in, I sh and I, I, I'll qualify this, but we normally can't go into an area where we have less than between seven and 8,000 union members in the general vicinity. I don't mean now in a small, just right in the small town, but we have stores where we have them spread out around the town and in the, in the county. Uh, I qualify that by saying that we've, we've done this in a number of areas where we have gone out, opened it up not only to the union member and his family, but also included all people on Medicare. In Kentucky, they've opened it up to the Association of the Blind, to the Stable Veterans Association, and also to the, I think it's the KAOP or something like that, the Kentucky Older and the Retired People's Association statewide. So that if you take your union membership that are in the areas, you supplement that with different organizations, and you may have many of them here that you may want to open this discounting dr of drugs up to. Uh, if we get to an area where we have a potential of seven to 8,000 customers, that's what we have to have to, to put a store into the area. And it's only a matter of simple economics, because if you go into an area where you don't have that, the store isn't going to go, because you're not going to give them enough volume to make out. As I say, he has to have 100 prescriptions a day volume on a break-even point. And we find that when you go into the smaller communities, if you, you're only trying to kid yourself that you think you're going to put a store on there because it's going to fail from our end, it's going to fail from your end, and you're going to have something that just, you know, you put into it and it's not going to succeed. But we've done, gone one step further in, in outstate Wisconsin now. We've had a couple of councils out there in smaller cities that have asked us to put a drugstore in on the basis that the prime criteria was to get the low-cost prescription drugs to the union member. And what we've done at their suggestion now is that we put the store into the city, we've opened the store up, we've given them the 60-day launch, the free <coughs> prescription launch, and that was good only for the union member and his family and the senior citizens in the community. After the 60 days, we'll come out with an announcement in the paper through the council that based on their community action or community services program, they are now going to open up the discount prescription drugs for the general community on behalf of the AFL-CIO Council in that particular area. By doing that, we'll then make a potential of possibly, well, in this one community, there's only there's 20,000 people in the city, so we'll pick up now a potential, really, of probably most of those people. But the reason I qualify this is that normally we have to have seven to 8,000 to go into an area, but depending upon how you'd want to handle it, if you want to open it up to these different organizations, if you can supplement your workforce. Now, we have areas, for instance, in Kentucky where Sam indicates he has around 5,000 union members in a council. But by opening it up to the Kentucky Old People's Association, to the Association for the Blind, and a few of these other organizations, we will supplement that workforce with enough people to give us a sufficient number of people, potential customers for the store, so we'll be able to go into smaller areas. We'll also establish, we have established in all the areas where we go, if state law allows, a mail order prescription drug business. Now, let's just assume, for instance, we opened a store here in Jackson sometime after the first <coughs> of the year. We would establish a statewide mail, mail order prescription drug program for the whole state that any of your union members could use until such time as we had stores put in other areas in the state that would be more convenient either to go to directly or to use mail order prescription drugs from. And the way the program is set up, as it is in Louisville right now, is say, for instance, a guy from Covington sends a prescription into Louisville. We have one store set up. It comes and it's delivered today. It's filled the same day it's delivered. It's put back in the mail that afternoon or the first thing the next morning. And if taking into consideration the, the, the Christmas rush, but outside of the Christmas rush, 
Normally that prescription will be back in his hands within 48 hours after the store received it. Now he's billed the same price on his prescriptions plus postage. He has 30 days to pay for the prescriptions. At the point he refills those prescriptions, he's expected to send back with that refill request a check or a money order because he knows in advance what the price will be and what the postage will be. As far as any price increases are concerned at the store or through the mails, you're giving one advance notice. In other words, if there's a price increase that we get from the manufacturer, you come into the store tomorrow, we got it today. We fill the prescription at the same price you paid before, and we tell you there's been a price increase, but it won't be effective until the next refill that you bring into the store so that you've got at least one refill prior to the price increase going into effect. That serves two purposes. Number one, it's good public relations for our operation to let you know in advance that there is a price increase and what the price increase will be. And number two, if you feel that uh, that 10 cents or 12 cents or whatever it might be on that prescription is excessive, you have between this refill and the next refill, whatever it might be, 30 or 60 or 90 days, to go out and shop prices and compare and see if now that there's been a price increase at our store, if we're still competitive. Um, so that you don't get hit with a price increase the day you walk in the store and it's completely news to you. It's explained to you. It's explained what the new price will be. On the mail order prescription drugs, the same thing happens. If a guy sends his prescriptions in, there's a price increase. We send a note back indicating there'll be a price increase on this particular prescription or the, one of the prescriptions in the container uh, effective on your next refill. We put in there what the price will be. If he sends any new prescriptions in through the mail, he has again 30 days to pay for the new prescription. If there's additional postage, that will be put on there. And of course, the next time he refills, you'll know then the old ones, what their prices uh, are going to be, and you'll also know what this latest refill will be also. So that he initially, on all his prescription buys through the mail, they really have 30 days to, to pay for it. We don't really push, push that too much. We publish in the, in the things that we print up that they have 30 days to pay for them because we want to get the money back. The reason we do that is that you don't want to have too many outstanding bills, and on top of that is that in the drug industry, uh, the way you get the lowest price on prescription drugs is the volume you buy in it. Uh, the big drug manufacturers give the lowest price to the, to the biggest buyers, and it's really that simple. On top of that, there's extra incentives. If you pay your drug bill, for instance, if you're ordering in lots of a quarter million dollars a year and more, if you pay your drug bill on the first of the month, following the month in which you receive shipment, in other words, if we order something in January, it's shipped to us in February, and say it's a $100,000 drug bill, if we pay that bill by the first of the following month, which would be March, we can get anywhere from 5 to 10% off on that drug bill by paying on time. So that's the other reason we try to encourage, again, people to pay these mail order prescription drugs because we have a amount of money that we have more or less, not in trust, but that we have that we work with, and we specifically have it for one reason, and that's to give us the discounts on the payment of the, of the drug bills. <coughs> as far as organized labor is concerned, there's no cost at all that, that, that goes back to the member, to the council, or to the state organization. We pay for the full, complete cost of any advertising that is done, even if it's done on the basis of coming through the AFL-CIO council. It can be set up on that basis as we did in Kentucky. But we pay for all the ads. In other words, the ads come out that this is an AFL-CIO program supported by the Kentucky State AFL-CIO. Those ads are really placed by Sam or by us on behalf of his organization, but we pay for them. We pay for all the printed materials, we pay for all the postage, we pay for all the costs that, uh, I think, in Louisville we went out and hired all the girls that were striking at COPS, which was about 16 or 18 at that time. They came in and did the mass mailing for us, we paid them by the hour, so that there's no cost involved to the local union, uh, none whatsoever. I don't care if it's a local council outstate or if it's a part of your state organization or who it might be, full cost of that distribution, all advertising, uh, is paid for by our organization, either on a direct basis or on a reimbursement basis. It makes a difference to us how we do it. The only time we've had to change that is that in Pennsylvania and Missis in, not Mississippi, but in Pennsylvania and Minnesota, they have some very strict laws there in regards to labor unions and in regards to the drug industry. And they can't get involved by uh, in, in this type of an operation and be reimbursed by any drug manufacturer or any pharmacy. So what we've done in those states to get around that is that all the bills that come into the local union headquarters, they call our office and tell us what the total amount is, and we write out a personal check from, from one of the officers, and the check goes down and the money is paid for. But on that basis, if we ever get subpoenaed before the State Board of Pharmacy, 
Uh, we do not have to tell the State Board of Pharmacy that our organization reimburse the labor unions for anything on, on this drug program. So it's still, as far as the public is concerned, it's still a union program from, from top to bottom. Uh, the scholarship program that you have there, we take a percentage of all profits from, from all the stores, and that's put into a scholarship trust fund that was established and approved by the federal government. We have a separate board of trustees in the city of Milwaukee that oversees this program. We have nothing to do with it. Uh, and the way it's set up is that they take the number of stores in the states in which we're operating on a percentage basis. If you have 10% of the total stores are in Mississippi, let's say as of March 31st, 10% of the total money in the scholarship fund is awarded then to the state, to the applicants in the state uh, that we have, if we have some from the state. I, I say that because last year we didn't have any from, from Minnesota as of March 31st, the cutoff date. But I think it's a pretty good program. It's open only to sons and daughters of union members or union co-ops or credit union members, union credit union members. Their sons and daughters or the members themselves can apply. Uh, they can either be a, a senior in, in high school going to college or they can be in college already and, and they can apply for it. There's no limitations on how many times you can win. You can win four years in a row or five years in a row for that matter. Last year we gave out $37,500 scholarships. The year before we gave out $25,500 scholarships. And we're hoping to have 50 $500 scholarships that will be available for these people for the fall term. Now, the cutoff date is March 31st. The awards are made in June for the fall term. What we do is when that happens, if we have award winners from a particular area, we try to go through either the state labor body or the local council, and we set up an awards dinner night, in which we pick up the cost on. We come in and we make the scholarship awards to the winners in that area. <coughs> or if there's more than one area that's involved, we try to get a country located and uh, have the award winners come in and have the leadership of organized labor there and have a nice dinner for them and make the awards and have the press invited. That's basically uh, our program. <coughs> I might make a couple of points on it. The $5 free, free prescription thing, again, has no, nothing tied into it. You're not obligated. You can come into the store, you can shop prices, you can get quotes on your prescriptions and walk out. You're not obligated to buy a thing. You can come in and, and, and take advantage of the free prescription and walk out and not buy anything else. There's no restrictions as far as how many prescriptions you can buy or how often you've got to go to the store. That's entirely up to you. All the material that doesn't require a prescription is pre-priced. When you walk into the store, there's a tag on every item that doesn't require a prescription. It has the retail price. It has a 20% off discount price for the union member. That's all pre-priced. The guy can come into our store and shop every item that we've got and walk out and know what every one of them sells for. He's not obligated to buy a thing. Normally the stores are open six days a week, 46 hours a week to start with. Now the reason we do that is because we'll come in, we'll open up Monday through Saturday, 46 hours a week. Short hours usually on Saturday and short hours on one day during the week when most of your doctors are off because in most areas you have one day when most of your clinics or your doctors are short hours. After the 60 days or even after 30 days, those hours will then be adjusted. He can open up any hours he wants, but he has to maintain at least 46 hours a week, six days a week in the store operation. But after he's got a feel for what the business is going to be, in other words, we find that in our operation, the shopping habits of our customers are a lot different than the regular drugstore because you're specifically getting people who, in most cases, are buying a prescription or more than one prescription in conjunction with a problem that they have. It's not where a person's coming to the drugstore to buy a ballpoint pen or to, to get a Coke or a hamburger or something like that. So what he will do, the local operator, well, he will adjust his store hours after that 30 days to compensate for what the shopping trends are going to be. In other words, if he finds that he may have to open up a little earlier on Monday and close a little later on Friday, or maybe possibly he's not open long enough on Saturday, maybe he should open up earlier on Saturday, he will increase his, his hours at that point to then have the hours fit to what people are, are, are using at the store as far as shopping habits are concerned. And you find that in, in most states, in most cities, every city is a little bit different. Some places you find that they shop long and late on Friday. A lot of places we find that people just don't buy prescriptions late on Friday night. They do a lot of their grocery shopping and they'll, they'll come in Saturday, but they're not there late Friday. So they'll adjust the hours on that basis. A couple of points I also wanted to make to you is that when we go into an area, we always Try to get the AFL-CIO, the UAW, and the Teamsters, those three segments. And the reason for that is because in most of your areas, you I'm not saying all, but in most of your, your big areas, you have some phases of 
the UAW and the Teamsters, where you, in, in, in most areas you, your concentration is primarily AFL CIO, with the exception of possibly Michigan. So we try to go through the council, but we also include those segments because it supplements it, and you're talking really about the three labor organizations that, that are prime as, as, as far as most areas are concerned. But what we do is this, as far as the AFL CIO councils are concerned, or the state labor bodies are concerned, we recommend to them that when you make a distribution on these cards, and we print the cards up specifically for you, that you do it on the basis of per capita. I think you can, I don't know if, if Claude can talk to Sam, but you can talk to Sam and, and he'll tell you, plus a lot of other councils, how it's worked where if you have a local union that you know has got 1,200 members and they're reporting eight, they get 800 free prescription cards, they get 800 uh, ID cards. Or as Sam did it, he did it on the basis of addressing the envelopes. And the envelopes were addressed on the basis of per capita. If they had 800 names but were only paying on 750, he just took the first 750 and addressed the envelopes, and that's all it was sent out. Since those stores have been opened, uh, he has increased his per capita substantially. I don't know what it is, but he's increased it substantially. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we do is that we do not issue any cards. We will not make any mailings through any other organization other than the council itself, the state organization, the AFL-CIO organization, the UAW or Teamsters. In other words, if we open up <coughs> an area and you have local unions who could be affiliated with the council but are not affiliated with the council, they get nothing from us. They have to, we tell them if you're a UAW member, you go through the UAW office. If you're a Teamster member, you go through the Teamster office. And if you're anything else, you go through the AFL-CIO state office or the AFL-CIO council office. And if you're not affiliated, you don't get any free prescription cards. You don't get any discount cards. We don't pick up any of the cost of the mailings. If Claude Ramsey calls us and says, okay, it's all right to do this, we'll do it. But other than that, we don't. And in, in essence, what it ends up is that if you can be affiliated and you're not, you can't get into the program. So we think it's worked quite well in a number of areas on that, on that basis. Uh, there's no cost, as I said before, involved in it, so that realistically, the $5 prescription thing is a, an incentive for the local union guy to come in the store and take advantage of that. That's free. We can't argue with the price of that. And from the standpoint of what the prescriptions are going to be, he can take advantage of the free prescription. He can get his prices on his other prescriptions at that point. He knows immediately what they're going to be. We'll quote him prices, and he can walk out if he's not satisfied. As far as the overall operation is concerned, uh, you can send a couple of you. can come to Milwaukee at, at our cost if you want. Look, the whole operation open. Our books are open to you at any time. And most of the areas, they've set up a working committee, so if they have any complaints or any problems, it's my job to work with organized labor throughout the United States on all of the operations that we have. Uh, we will show you our wholesale prices, our buy prices, what our selling prices are. We don't have uh, a list that we can set in front of you and say this is going to be the selling price in every prescription at any time that you can look at. What we do, and these are also available to you at any time, is we run IBM runs, and that's, this is really what it looks like. And what it comes out with is it gives the name of the drug, the tablets and the selling price and the different quantities that, that are listed as you get into hundreds, tens, fifties, and that comes that IBM run comes off uh, every month. Uh, we have a firm that does this for us, an accounting firm that does this for us, as far as selling price is concerned. Now we use that for two reasons, specifically for selling price in the store, and also because all this information is fed through a computer. So that if we get a, a fellow, and we've had this happen twice, he franchises a store, the business is really booming, and suddenly he decides that, well, why can't he just increase his price on a couple of these top sellers 5% or 10%? Because in many areas, like for instance in Louisville, where you find some of these quotations on, on, on drugs that the guy is getting maybe 100 for a buck and a half more than 50. Uh, these are substantial savings, so you get a guy who figures that if he can just increase it a half a dollar or a dollar more, he doesn't report this to the home office and he's going to make a little bit more money. And who's going to notice the difference? Because after all, it'll still be a hell of a savings on prescription drugs. But where he gets caught is that we feed all this information to the computer. Everything he buys from the warehouse is fed into the computer. How much he buys, how much he pays for it, when he pays for it, we know the volume of front-end material, non-prescription items he buys, how many he buys when he buys, and we know, on a, we have cash registers that we buy specifically, and on, these are all keys. So in other words, there's no way he can change this. He has to punch, and whatever shows up on that sale will be key punched into the tape. So those are sent to our office every week. All the information is fed into the computer. If we find that based on his gross 
buys, his gross, gross sales, and his expenses, that if he varies 1%, or even a half a percent, we get a report, if we get the reports on Monday, we get a report back from the computer on Wednesday, and we can tell by Wednesday if he's off a half a percent to a percent. So if we get a guy who's gonna suddenly decide he's gonna start making more money off of a union member because he's below everybody else, we have our store supervisor down there, and he has to file a six-page report with us the following week as to what he found. And when he goes in and makes a six-page report, he goes back over the last 200 prescriptions that were sold in the store, and verifies the prescription as it was written, and what the selling price was that was charged, and verifies that with what the price should have been. And he has to maintain what we tell him to maintain in that store, so that if he does get out of line, we can get on top of him right away. Also, the same thing happens if you find somebody for suddenly we find a certain particular drug, his direct buys from the warehouse is slacked off maybe by 20%. And we can go in and we can check him out, we can find out if he's buying now that same prescription drug item from a small manufacturer who doesn't have good quality control and possibly is getting 10% off, we'll find that out immediately because it'll show up through the computer based again on his overall gross sales and his net income. And as soon as we pick that up, we can go right into the store and we can pick out just about the drug that, uh, that is in question. If we find it on the shelf, it's got to come off. That's all there is to it. So these are the controls we have over them. I think the biggest control as far as organized labor is concerned is that uh, there's nothing in writing that indicates that it's going to be a fixed fee or a fixed markup. But uh, I think Sam has already hit it in the head when he said the biggest control we got over you fellas at the point we don't like you, we're going to shut you down because we're just going to put a picket line up. And that's really, that's it in, the, in, in a nutshell because uh, 95 to 98 percent of the people that are in our store are union members. At the point our prices aren't right, your rank and file guys aren't going to come to the store. And that's, that's going to be the end of union prescription drugs because we can't survive on 20 or 30 or 40 prescriptions a day. We've got to have the volume. As far as the overall operation is concerned, how it's operated in the community and the type of operation that, that's involved, uh, you have the control over that by, by going directly to me. And if there's any problems in regards to his labor contract or, in, or how he's operating that store or the hours he's operating the store, uh, all he's got to do is call me. We get with the local franchisee and we'll get the problem adjusted. But I think basically overall the, the big club or the big control you have over us more so than anything else is the fact that without your approval, without your support, and without saving the union member money, uh, our program is absolutely worthless to you. And, that's a, and that would be the same as if six months from now somebody came in and undersold us on prescription drug needs. No matter what you and I might tell the rank and file guy, if he knows he can get it cheaper across the street, that's where he's going to go. And in most cases, you're not going to get him back. So we know that we have to maintain fast service and low prices if we're going to maintain the program. What would you say on an average the savings to have uh, compared to? I would say generally, I would. Overall, I would say the average is between 20 and 30 percent, but I, I think that you'll find that if you talk to Sam, for instance, and I only raise that issue because yeah. Louisville we, really surprised us. We have found that there are, the, overall, the price of prescription drugs are higher than in Louisville than any place that we've been in, and that's uh, usually not the case because you find generally your bigger cities in the states, and I'm not saying Louisville's bigger than Detroit, but I'm saying when you go into a state and you find the bigger cities in the state, Normally, they're more competitive on a number of items. But what has really surprised us in Louisville is that that's just that's not so. That they're paying more for they were paying more for prescription drugs in Louisville than a lot of union members were paying in small cities in outstate Wisconsin and Michigan. And uh, I don't know if that maybe is general further south. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure about that. <coughs> we're not sure about that. But we we would think that probably the percentage of, of savings on drugs is going to be higher overall in Louisville than any place else. The reason that I feel that way is because Sam has been having people call him. He's been running surveys on, on drug savings, and uh, uh, he has a lot of documented cases on, on what they are. But more importantly is that the, the prime factor as far as we're concerned is what the stores are doing. And those three stores right now are to the point where they've already have, they're looking for pharmacists to, to bring into the store because they're, they're up to around almost 200 prescriptions a day in each store. Now that normally we don't normally reach that volume until a store has been open about a year to a year and a half, and we've really only gone over that volume in Detroit and a few stores in Milwaukee, but generally they don't get over that. Now in Louisville, they're already up to that. And how long have they been in operation? Just a few months. Yeah, right, just uh, shortly after the convention. Right, and we just get Or just before the convention. Are you comparing those prices with the 
your Rexall, Walgreens, or with your discount stores like Miller's and Gibson's. Well, yeah, with, really with any of them. Because well, I'll tell you why. Miller's and Gibson's are so much cheaper than Walgreens and, 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 Rex, and Rexall. That's why. Well, let me say this. Rexall is... Uh, People thinking that they have, you know, are a large chain. It's a, it's a big misconception because actually all Rexall does is that you're really, it isn't even a franchise operation. Really what happens is that you can take a local independent and he goes to Rexall and he franchises their name, but it, it's either, there's either no charge or minimum charge. He puts his name out in front. And what that really obligates him to do is that he now can buy all the, the name brand material that has Rexall's name on it. But as far as prescription drug items are concerned, he's still ordering his drugs as his store needs them, and you find that uh, he's paying the maximum. Because in, in, in drugs, the way it works is that if you, for instance, if you sell, if you normally go through uh, in your local small store, uh, let's just say around between two and 300 thyroid tablets a month, and that isn't many, but I use it as an example. So you buy possibly three bottles of 100 in each bottle. You pay the maximum, the, the highest price for prescription items imaginable, is for that. When you buy them, buy the smallest containers on an individual container basis, you pay the most. If you go to a bottle of 500, you save a little money. If you go to a bottle of 1,000, you save more. If you buy a case of, let's see, three, there's 12 bottles of 500 in a case, you save a lot more. But when you get involved in our operation, we buy them in truckloads. They come to our warehouse, we re we have, uh, we're licensed by the federal government as a jobber. What that means is that we can bust these up, we put them into counting machines, they go through and maybe we put a half million pills through that machine, they count them out as a container of 100 each. Then we can ship three or four of those bottles of 100 each to the store in Jackson or the store in Louisville. And the price he's paying, that store is paying us, the reimbursement price, is our wholesale price based on possibly a million pills at a time. So that the local store operator, whether it be in Walgreens, there's really no competition. I'll tell you how Walgreens works, frankly is that they have what they call lost leaders. They'll take the top 30 selling drugs out of the top 30 selling drugs in the community and nationally. They will probably take anywhere from five to eight and they will sell at their cost or maybe in some cases even below cost. But from that point on, uh, the national average market is 68% on prescription drugs. And what they will do is they'll range anywhere from 68 as high as 200% markup. The guy who comes in for a short term medication, like a lot of your stores have what they call a minimum walk-in. A guy comes in and gets 15 tablets because he maybe has a cold or a little condition, and they charge him a buck and a half or two bucks, and that's their minimum charge. Well, that same prescription in our store might cost 37 cents or 47 cents. We don't have a minimum walk-in charge at our stores. So you see the percentage of markup that they're making on short-term medication is fantastic, but the average person who is bothered by something today goes into one of these stores <coughs> and buys a prescription that the doctor maybe gives them for two weeks or seven days the child has got a sore throat and says, well, take these tablets for a week and come back and see me. So they go in and for $2, who's going to argue? You get a week's supply of pills or 15 pills for $2, that isn't much money. It's very cheap to be cured. But the average person doesn't realize that in many, many cases, the pharmacist might be paying a penny or a half penny a piece for those pills, depending upon what they are. And of course, when you look at it from the standpoint of a minimum walking of $2, say his wholesale price is $0.17, cents, uh, that's over a 1,000% markup. So that most of your chains, that's how they work it. And of course, it's the same on the front end. What they what they lose on the front end, like when they sell Melox below cost, and when they sell all these other items at cost or below cost, they've got to make it up somewhere because they have more expense, more operating, more overhead than anybody else does. And they usually make it up in their prescription drug needs. But for instance, we find, we shop all the drug stores. We, we can go into an area sometimes and find a big Walgreens store. And we'll shop them today, and we'll shop them a week from today. And each prescription has to be given a number, and those numbers are logged numerically. That's, that's a rule and a regulation they have to follow. So we can look at the number on the prescription we shopped last week, Wednesday, and the one we shopped this week, Wednesday, and subtract them. We can find it. We can see right there how many prescriptions they're filling per day. And uh, a lot of times you can go into a big, big store and find out they're only doing 20 or 30 prescriptions a day. Well, Miller's and Gibson's are the biggest stores here. Well, they really this is discounts. This is discounts. Yeah. Yeah. But see, you'll find that when you, we go into an area that, that, as I said before, there's nobody that can sell overall for less than we can. Have you, uh, are you familiar with the operations she's talking about? Do they have them in Louisville? I'm surprised. Which one? Gibson. Miller's and Gibson. Miller. Gibson. I'm pretty sure they They're have Gibson. They're half of what Miller's. Walgreens is yeah. going to They're way under Walgreens and Rexall. They're not even in comparison. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think as well as she raising this question here because 
in this particular area, we do have these discount uh, uh, stores mm -hmm. she's talking about, and I'm wondering, you know, just how how your your setup would compare with them. Them. I think yeah. this is something we need to check out yeah. and before we get into it, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, there's, there's, there's two ways to do it, but the easiest huh? way is if what? if they're marketing them out to anything, and I, I'm in no position to know, it'll run 25, 30 percent discount. Twenty five to thirty cents compared to the to Rex oh, yeah, and right. the others. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard at least. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I would say this the easiest way to, the easiest way for us to, to, to verify it would be that to uh, if you can get us a list of, of, of drugs and uh, there's a number of ways you can do it in some areas we've actually used retirees. Simply find out what the prescription is written for, what the name of the drug is, if it's a ten milligram or five milligram tablet and how many are on the prescription. Have them go to three or four stores and quote the price and just keep track of those prices that they quote them. And then when he goes to the so-called discount house, have it filled there and make sure that they quote you that price, they fill it for that price. Take the prescription home, count the pills, make sure you got 50 or 100, whatever you ordered. And then give us a list, we've done it, give us a list of 25 or 30 drugs and we'll, I'll mark our selling price right next to them and mail them right back to you and you can see exactly what the savings will be. As I say, it, it's going to vary because you'll find that, uh, again, whether it be a discount house or a Walgreens store, whatever it might be, they have their they have their come on items or loss leaders, and they also have the rest of them where they make out substantially on. Uh, but on top of that, you've got to also take into consideration not only that, but also where your membership is, is located. In other words, if you have enough of these discount stores around the city that they're going to serve all the people. Then you can pretty much go on their prices because they'll probably be lowballing all the way around, and we have to be competitive with them. If not, you should look at it from the standpoint of not only what the discount house are selling them for, but also what the other drugstores are selling them for in the areas where your people are living, because that's the prices they're going to be paying unless they're well, traveling. How do you compete with their hour, the store hours open, like you said, 46 hours? Majority of these stores open from nine to ten. Well, all right, let me tell you this. As far as hours are concerned. Uh, that really is no problem. We used to have the stores open many years back. We had the stores open seven days a week. We went on that in Michigan, and we found we found a number of things. Number one, we used to be open till nine o'clock every night. Uh, that uh, in most cases, that between seven and nine o'clock at night, there was very little, very little prescription business, very little prescription business on Sundays. And on those prescriptions that we did have on Sundays were refills. Now, from the standpoint of a refill. It's really then a question of getting the people accustomed to the shopping hours. In other words, if you can refill a prescription on Sunday, you could have refilled it just as well on Friday or on Saturday or the following Monday, unless you waited until the, the last pill was taken. At that point, it might then become an emergency. But we had shopping hours a, a lot, a lot longer hours, and we cut them down because we just found that the people just aren't there. Well, there must be a lot of people that use the anchor hours, like say I did work, and they use those anchor hours to refill because the stores are full with people just, you know, getting refills. Somebody's get from the store. If you stand in line, wait for your prescription. You can wait an hour right That's now for true. a prescription, I'll or you can call, call in and hours go two hours, hours later to pick it up. So they're doing the business. Isn't they? Yeah, they're doing the business. This is the one of the things that I think Roger that we <coughs> we need to check out that you need to check out and to see how <coughs> how your prices would compare with these discount stores we have because they are doing a tremendous business. I can uh, find out from Sam if they got, I think he mentioned Gibson's, but the other one I doesn't ring a bell. Miller's 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 but most Miller's Miller's cities have. They're about 25% under the Rexall and the Walgreens yeah. people and stuff like Some that. Some items are worth that. Yeah. You said uh, ordinary there's about a 68% markup in the, in the regular. That's the average regular. markup. But as I said, that's the average markup on prescription drugs. But to get that average, you'll find that you got discount chains that work on less than that. But most of your independents work on substantially more than that. Mm -hmm. um, because in, mo in most cases, they're working on a substantial markup, and it's pretty much what the traffic will bear. That's, that's how most independents work, unless a guy's going to try to shoot prices and build up his prescription business. But in most cases, it's a local drugstore. They've got a local trade from within the area, and they'll set their prices based on what the, what the people will complain about. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, we find in Louisville, all the areas where we open up stores, after the stores are opened up, suddenly they start to advertise that they'll they'll meet any uh, anybody else's prices, or they'll tell the, the customer if they're going to ask for a transfer of prescription. They find out what you're going to pay at the at union prescription drug, and we'll, we'll give it to you for the same price. Yeah. Of course, 
initial reaction to that is, well, if you could do that now, why haven't you been doing that for the last five years that I've been coming here? Uh, but you, you find that as the guy goes into the store, in most cases, if you try to dicker with your pharmacist, uh, you can probably get him down, uh, independent guy, because he has a hell of a lot of markups to play with. And we've had many cases like that. For instance, you know, prescription drugs over the years have not been items that people shop prices on. In most cases, a person uh, just doesn't do it. You know, he just doesn't go in and shop the price on prescription drugs at a couple of drugstores. Well, now in a lot of your bigger cities, and, and, and primarily I think because of organized labor's involvement in a lot of these programs, people are shopping prescription drug prices more. And we have found in a lot of areas where your sometimes your senior citizens will say that they have gone to different drugstores and got quotes on prices, and there were substantial differences. They went to six different drugstores and got six different prices. And that's really how widespread it is. So that, and again, in regards to, to percentages, it, it all will depend on, on how much the average markup is here in, in Jackson. Or like, for instance, in Louisville, we find there that uh, even though they have discount houses there, uh, and they might be 20 or 25 percent lower than the independents, uh, the independents are way out of line on their price. So the 25 percent is a, is a direct savings, but compared to the overall pricing that we're working on, it's still high because... What was your, what was the uh, comparison with the discount uh, in, in your store in Louisville? I'm sure they've got them in there, if you're not asking them, because your store is going to be in competition with the discount yeah. house. Yeah, yeah. And what did you discover? Well, we, we found there that, the, that uh, <laughs> they're running about six, anywhere from 15 to a little over 20 percent. That this you would with, be under them yes. that much? Yeah. Of the, of the, of the that you could still be under the discount right. house anywhere from 15 to 20. Right. Let me ask a question about uh, some of these, uh, some of these appeals. Are they, are, are they uh, a fair trade item or, or a fixed price yeah. item or, or what? Well, uh, the reason I'm asking the question, let me give you uh, what, I, what I'm talking about. A certain pill that uh, uh, a friend of mine bought across the United States. He paid 60 cents a pill for that wherever he went. Uh, he happened to be in, Ari uh, in uh, Argentina, and he bought that same pill for a dime in Argentina, and it's made, made in the pharmaceutical house in New Jersey. Yeah. Well, let me say this. Uh, in, in, in the pharmacy field, there's a lot of rules and regulations that the individual drugstores maintain. I'll tell you one of them. In fact, we uh, I didn't tell you this on the way down here, but we have to appear before the Kentucky uh, board of Pharmacy on this, and it's, uh, as far as we're concerned, it's nothing but a setup. But one of the see one of the things that they have is that pharmac pharmacists have an unwritten rule, and this is national, that on a transfer of a prescription drug that you honor the you honor the last price. In other words, if I transfer my prescription from drugstore A to drugstore B, legally they have to call drugstore A and verify this this, and then also verify it with the the doctor. They are not really allowed to fill off of a photostat or a recopy unless the doctor fills it out himself. But other than that, they can't do it legally. They have to call the drugstore and the doctor both, primarily the doctor. Well, where we usually get in trouble with the pharmacists is, of course, we come in, we're discounting number one, but number two, we don't honor, we don't honor price on transfer. In other words, the guy comes to our store, he pays our price. We don't care what the other store was charged on. We have our price, and that's the way it's gonna be. Well, what happened in Louisville is that that's just exactly how they've nailed us now. They had a pharmacist, and we got a transfer on a prescription. The prescription was filled. And they then call the doctor, and the doctor claims that we never called him. So now that that pharmacist, who's a competitor in the city, has now filed a, a complaint with the state board, and the state board's going to set up a hearing that they'll probably go before the state board. And uh, of course, the hearing will be based on whether or not we violated that provision. If we did, they'll try to revoke our license. But it's it's a setup that they use. But it irritates the pharmacist because the unwritten law of a, a pharmacy is that uh, you honor the other person's price on the first transfer. The other thing that I was going to point out is that uh, one of the things that, that, that we have found when we shop prescription drugs is we all tell people to count your pills because everybody's going to make a mistake. But when we go into an area, a lot of times we've used the retirees or the National Council of Senior Citizens locally to do shopping of drugstores for us. And we have found that when they get back and we check to make sure they got the proper pill that they were supposed to be given, one of two things can sometimes happen. They go into a pharmacy, they require... Uh, a brand name drug and the pharmacist interchanges and gives them a generic drug but yet charges them the higher price. Now there's a difference in price between the generic and the brand name. Uh, so we verified that was that was the illegal. That's not supposed to be done. 
Uh, the other thing that we found that in many, many cases they shortchange you. It's, and it's a 10% it's a, it's a shortchange. A guy comes in for a tablet, for instance, where the doctor gives you 100 tablets and he marks it one in the morning, one at lunch, and one at supper as needed. So normally you would take three a day, but if you're feeling good today, you may not. A good example is the gout. A guy feels good, he doesn't take the tablet all day long. The next day it's bothering him, maybe two, three days later it's not bothering him. But what happens is the point that he gets to the last pill, the 100th pill in that container, he really doesn't know how many he used. He assumes he used 100. But a lot of pharmacies will shortchange you by 10%. They'll take, they give you 90 pills for the, and charge you for the price of 100. Uh, or even we found a lot of prescriptions where the guy got a 30-day supply of drugs and he ended up with 27 pills. Well, if you don't count your pills, and especially on those prescriptions where you take them as needed, or one a day plus an additional one for pain at night if you need it or something to that effect, what happens is that 30 days from now, 60 days from now, or six months from now, unless you mark every pill down, you have no way of knowing how many pills that you've taken. So what happens is, number one, he gets the higher amount of money, and number two, he he shortchanges you by 10% of your prescription. And we had in Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee, and also the city of Detroit, the Catholic Archdiocese in the city of Detroit shopped the whole city. Primarily to see the difference in drug prices between the core area and what they call the low income area and the suburbs and the, the wealthier sections of the city. And they found the same thing. They found the same drug prices very substantially. And, they, and the article that they printed, I didn't bring a reprint of it, but they found that Union Prescription Drug was the lowest of the store that they shopped. But the biggest thing that they found was that in most of the prescriptions, they were shortchanged. Now, the average pharmacist can say, well, I made a mistake. But hell, we've shopped too many stores in too many areas, and it, it happens too many times. You know? And a 30-day supply of pills would be short three pills. Uh, you might take them home, and 15 days later, or that the, yes, when you get to the 27th or 28th pill, you realize that uh, the average person is not going to call a pharmacist. He's going to think, well, I must have lost them in the drawer, or maybe the wife had them in her purse or something like that. But there, we, don't, we don't have any policies like that. There's nothing in prescription drugs where you have a fixed fee or a fair trade item in, in prescription drug items. And we don't abide by them anyways, even if they were, because there are some items in the front end, some vitamins that are supposed to be fair trade items, and we, we don't abide by it. We sell them at our discount price. And the reason we do that is because we, we were sued in the state of Michigan on that same basis, and we won the suit uh, on the basis that it was a violation of federal law, restraint of trade law. Uh, and we, they've never contested us in any other states, and we've never contested it nationally. So we just figured we let it go because we know we can do it. If they want to take us on, we'll go to court. And it's the same with a lot of your states have very restrictive state board of pharmacy rules and regulations on how you can maintain your pharmacy. And many of these are in direct conflict with federal law. Uh, let me give you a prime example. Under the UAW program, and the machinists have it in some of their plants now, and uh, the rubber workers, I think, have been uh, negotiate a similar program. But the UAW negotiated a program where the rank and file guy comes in and he pays the first two dollars on a prescription, a 34-day supply of drugs. The balance of that prescription, or the wholesale price, is paid for by Blue Cross Blue Shield or by Aetna. Well, in all the stores that we operate, we do that for a dollar seventeen cents in our stores. If there's any drug program that's negotiated, if we can do it for less, we do it for less. Well, in the state of Michigan, when that happened, the State Board of Pharmacy filed an injunction and wanted to shut us down as an unethical operation because we were undercutting or underselling the professional fee on this negotiated program. And uh, the, the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and the UAW came in more or less as a friend of the court in, in, in an argument of the case. But what they were saying is that, number one, we could not illegally reduce this negotiated program and do it for less money. Uh, number two, they also brought into it that when we first advertised this, they also picked out Flint, Michigan, because we opened the store there at the same time. And they, they said that it was a violation of, of state law to give away a free prescription. That was illegal. And the third aspect was that they, they, were, they were saying that it was uh, indirect advertising on our part because the labor union was going out and hand-billing the plant and telling their membership that they could get the same drug program at our stores for $1.17 rather than paying $2 at all the other stores. Well, we ended up winning the case, but the Attorney General in the state ruled on the basis that, number one, that the state board has no rules and regulations that prohibit in any way, shape, or form what a labor union tells its membership. Number two, that uh, as far as the free prescription is concerned, that this would be a violation of federal law, it would be in conflict with federal law, indicating that we can't give a $5 free prescription away. 
And the other aspect, as far as cutting that $2 professional fee, they indicated this was a negotiated program between General Motors or whoever it might be in the UAW or the machinist, and that it was negotiated on the basis that those participating in drug stores would not get reimbursed the first $2 but that if they didn't want to charge anything for the prescription, that was entirely up to the, to the drugstore. So we won the whole case, cost us about $40,000 in court. But in every place that we go, these are the, the items, the areas that we run into because uh, the Board of Pharmacy is appointed by the governor in most cases, and they are appointees who are owners and operators of either chain stores or groups of stores or large independent stores. Do you have uh, trouble with a shortage of funds? No, we, we used to when we had the, our own, you know, we operated the stores, but now on a franchise basis, the local franchisee will then be the owner operator and he will be responsible for any fill in pharmacists that he needs or at the point his volume gets up, if he needs more pharmacists, he will hire his own locally. If you ever operated while you're in the state, you ask whether they don't have enough. I had to throw that in. I showed him the fence. <laughs> yeah, come in. <laughs> uh, Roger, well, I think what she's getting at, uh, she's probably thinking about maybe you might have trouble finding pharmacists if, if, if in Mississippi if you if wants to get into this. All right, let me say this. What, what we do is that, and that's one of the reasons why we have the meeting like we have today, is that if you're interested in the program and you want to go with the program, at the point that we know that you're going to support it, and all we really need from you is a verbal commitment to that effect that, you know, you will support it, you let us know what areas you've got your council member members in and what areas you want to target or if you want to pick one particular city and target that first, you let us know. At that point, what we do is we then, we have a mailing that we make. In fact, the envelopes that you've got right there are the envelopes that we sent out to the pharmacists and we included at the franchise program. I, I use them for distribution too, but we make a mass mailing. If we want to go into Jackson, we make a mass mailing to all the registered pharmacists in the Jackson area. And for that matter, even in, in, in outstate Mississippi, indicating that we we're coming into the state, uh, we're going to have a number of stores in the state, but we're targeting Jackson as the first area, and nine chances out of ten we'll pick a guy up locally here. Now, he may be a pharmacist who's working for somebody else, he may be a pharmacist who already owns a store and wants to open this store as a second store, or he may be a pharmacist who is in deep <coughs> trouble right now with this store, maybe he's not competitive in price, he's got an older store. We can come in and completely remodel the store and convert the store into a union prescription center. It takes us five weeks. It's like, in other words, if the guy decides to go today, we can have the store completely <coughs> remodeled and fixtured in five weeks and open for business. On, uh, his, on his part, uh, financially, what is he obligated for? Well, he 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 signs a, a long-term note for the for the cost of the remodeling and for the cost of the drugs that go into the store. That's retailable over five years. <coughs> Uh, the franchise fee is twelve thousand dollars, and basically, what the franchise, what he's paying for in the franchise fee, is the time that that I'm spending uh, throughout the area, uh, the real estate location work that's done, uh, the any any work that's done as far as the fixturing, the layout of the stores, uh, any and all setups of the whole complete store from the standpoint of real estate fixturing, remodeling, everything is included in that. At the point he opens. Realistically, at that point, the only thing he really should owe will be five-year repayable note for the complete expense of the of what the what is in the store at that point. In other words, the fixturing, which is repayable over five years, and all the drugs that are that are put into the store and the remodeling costs that are put into the store. But that's a one-time franchise fee that he pays. And then the, our company, the, the, the Union Prescription Drug, takes four percent of gross sales. And that's to maintain the complete operation. All advertising that is done to the store, the warehouse, uh, everything and anything that goes into the operation of this store. I would think it's a tight rent situation. That there might not be that many pharmacists. Well, $12, well, surprisingly, there's a lot of you know that really there's a lot of them who, who who we can pick up. It's just really a question of getting in. And we've got arrangements. They can either get they can either get a, that five year note. That's either repayable. They can get a loan if they want, or they can go through us and, and sign it through us. It makes no difference to us which way they go. They have that. Well, they pay their account. own rent and, and, and uh, own, own expenses every month. Yeah. Right. Well, they, uh, but again, we carry. Actually, if the guy isn't doing the business, we carry him until such time as he's on his feet. So if you did have a store that was going slow for the first six months. 
he still draw all of his operating expenses and his bills and his salary is he draws that out of his gross sales and and we're re reimbursing him for that so that he's not losing any money until he gets on his feet now the uh, the thing that i think we are interested in here about as much as anything else is the control of the, that we'll have over the program as we get into it and <clears throat> you have already said i think pretty well what what i think they are interested in and that's the fact that that this, if the state flcl endorses it and gets into it that everything will be controlled out of this office all right the membership cards and who uh, we make the decision on people that might participate in addition to our own members right. we can sit down a set of rules that say that uh, only an affiliated union member has access to it right. uh, and the things of this kind Right. I believe I also understood you to say that, that you pay the cost of any mailings or anything that to promote the program and advertise it. In other words, it uh, won't cost us anything to endorse the program. Right. All you want out of us really is, is, uh, is endorsement right. and, uh, and a willingness to promote it. Right. right. At that point, because at that point, then we, that's, that's another thing really that comes out of the franchise fee. It sounds like a lot of money, but it really is in the sense that the time that's spent be prior to opening the store, for instance, the mailing, that mailing in itself costs a hell of a chunk of money. In most cases, it costs about $2,000 to make an area mailing to a, to, to a small city. Do you uh, mean, did you do a, a, a mass mailing to the membership in Kentucky, to all of the individual members? No, no, I'm talking about it as far as the pharmacist, picking up a pharmacist is concerned. Mm -hmm. But as far as, as, as Louisville is concerned, the, what we did is we didn't make a mass... Let me say this. Say I made a mailing to all the councils that the program's coming in. It's been yeah. endorsed. And uh, that the mail order program would be set up. And we made distribution of the mail order brochures at the state convention. But as far as the stores are concerned, we made a mass mailing to every affiliated member of the Louisville AFL-CIO Council mm -hmm. out of the state offices right in Louisville. How many? What, what's the membership in that area? Well, right? the initial mailing was, was, was uh, 30,000. 30,000. 30,000. But, you know, since we've made the mailing, he, uh, <coughs> he's picked, he he sent down and we picked up 15,000 additional cards. Now, I understand, I'm not sure, you have to talk to Sam, but I understand he's picked up about 5,000 mm -hmm. in per capita since the store has opened up. Because yeah. we sent, that, we, affiliated groups yeah, we sent him down 5,000 more of those free see, cards. This is one of the things that I'm very much interested in. And I can see this program as being a, something that would, would help, really help on the affiliation. Roger, uh, let me uh, ask you this question. Um, now, we talk about, you spoke about uh, the requirement on uh, membership in an area or a membership plus membership in any other organization we might include. Um, say we've got uh, uh, seven or eight areas in the state where we've got the required membership just in the organized labor I'm talking about our own organization now are you in position to if we okay the program are you in position to begin seeking uh, participating pharmacists in all those areas right but you would, rec you would recommend that we start out in an area or the pilot project so to speak where we're pretty reasonably sure that it could be a success yeah. In other words, the best area to start out with, for you and for us both, would be actually to take the cities where you have your biggest councils right now and target those areas. But for, let me just say this, as far as our readiness to go, if you, <coughs> if you would vote today that you're gonna endorse the program, when I get back to Milwaukee, uh, our guy that goes out and interviews pharmacists uh, right now, and he's got, he's got the whole month of January is, is, is hold. Until if there's a decision from Mississippi, he will be he will be the mailing will be made in January. He'll be down here interviewing pharmacists the latter part of January. What about say the city of Jackson to make it the problem of someone living say way over in North Jackson and the store is located in well, South Jackson? Well, you're going to depend upon how many members you have, how many total you members you have. If you have enough, we could put two stores here. But we, let me say this: We don't put stores in a downtown area unless it's a very small city. Our stores, we, and that's another thing we have found, that as far as shopping habits are concerned, we we get the try to put the store right in the residential area where the where most of your blue collar people are are living, or in a central residential area for the blue collar collar people, 
and uh, we try to get a store that's about a thousand square feet in size. Uh, these are just a couple of pictures of some of the two of the stores that we've got to give you some idea. That's a standard sign we use, and that's some of the shots of the front and the back of the store, inside of the store. They're about a thousand square feet in size, which is very small. We always try to get them that they have off-street parking, of six to eight cars off-street parking, and if you do, if we do go into an area where you have a good transit system, a bus system or public service system, we try to get right on it or close to it. If you don't have one, then all we, we try to do is, is find some store where there's good off-street parking that's easy to get to. Try to get on a main, maybe an out away in a residential area on a main thoroughfare. Do you go, do you go into the shopping centers? Uh, the only, well, we stay away from shopping centers unless they're small, what we call strip shopping centers, where maybe you have like, uh, if you have any of these convenience, food marts down here, what they do is they build a small, yeah, well, we, uh, we go on a number of those because you're off, and in most cases, you're a little, just a little ways off the street, you got a lot of parking, people can pull in and pull out very easily. Uh, big shopping centers, many times, it's, uh, you find that they either go way out or they're way downtown, and what we don't want to do is we don't want to put a, a store in an area where it's too hard for your senior citizens to get to, because you see, very honestly, these are the people who are really going to save the money because where we're the sharpest is on maintenance drugs. You see, the guy who takes medication, long-term medication, for the rest of his life, or the, he's an older person, he's on medication, he's going to be taking either the rest of his life for a hell of a long time. These are the prescriptions where your, your average drugstore makes out on because, you see, these are the guys that they bang the big increases to because they know the guy's going to keep coming back. They, he, he's, he's, he's here forever and a day, or he's going to be here consistently for a long time. And maintenance drugs is really the sharpest prices that we've got because on people that are on long-term medication, the best buy that we got is our, in our hundreds because you see we can buy in, in big volume and repackage into hundreds. And you find that people who are on maintenance drugs, many times your doctors will write in hundreds. If they don't, we encourage them to get them written in hundreds because the best price that we've got, I don't mean the best price that we've got competitively with anybody else, but I'm saying the best price that we can give you on any drug is in lots of 100 each because that's that's what we repackage them down into 100 so that when a guy comes into our store, we just take the vial that's already prepackaged and coated, take the label off and put a new label on or simply put it into his container. And that's it, that's all we do. We don't have to bust it down or nothing. It's already pre-counted and these are all counted by machine. That's another reason why when it, as, as far as the efficiency of the store operation is concerned, most of the stuff, a lot of the stuff that comes out of the warehouse in Milwaukee is all pre-packaged and pre pre-labeled, so that it's just a question of taking our label off, which you have to have on by federal law because you have to put a number of coated material off of the manufacturer's label. In other words, the lot number, when it was manufactured, all these things are on there, and that has to go onto our label. So when they ship them down here and the guy comes into the store and he wants whatever it might be in hundreds, we just either put a new label on, and he had to type a new one out anyways, or take his old container and just dump them in there. That's it. And of course, when he's talking about a buck and a half over wholesale price for anything over eight dollars wholesale, uh, you get involved on our wholesale price, which is substantially less than anybody else. And he's he's work at that point. He's working on a dollar and a half. And of course, the, our best wholesale is anything we buy in hundreds that we can buy in hundreds or more and repackage. So when you're talking about hundreds and uh, a prescription that costs over eight dollars wholesale, that's the best price. You are you just talking about taking the manufacturer's label off and they're putting on the prescription? Well, no, what happens is the bottle comes in and we, you can't take the manufacturer's label off, but what you do is on, the, on that label, there's a number of coatings on the side of it. Lot number, data was manufactured, uh, and there's a serial number on each container, too, that comes to manufacture. Well, what you have to do is if you take a bottle of 500 and break them down into five bottles of 100 each, you have to put a label on each one of those containers of 100 and it has to have all the material that's coated on that label. So that's what, what that's done for is that the federal government says that we have a license to do that. But if a federal narcotics guy comes into our store in Jackson, if we had one, or into Louisville, he can walk up and he can pick up anything that we recount in the, in the warehouse. He can pull it off the shelf and he can tell who made it, the date it was made, the code number, the date it was repackaged. And also on these containers is also our wholesale price. So if you walk into our store, we had a store in Jackson, or any of you guys could walk in the store tomorrow, you could walk over and pick up something off the shelf. Anything we repackage at a wholesale price, our wholesale price for that amount of pills in that container is right on there. And of course, the other way you can verify it real, real simply is uh, uh, by simply, as I say, come to Milwaukee and we'll, we'll take you through the warehouse and our accounts receivable office any day of the week and show you 
Our records are all open to you. Well, I've been in the drugstore where I've seen this particular drug is take a, take a bottle of pills off of the shelf. Evidently, it's patent medicine. And just take a razor blade and scrape that, uh, that off and put your prescription label on there. Yeah. Now, had he not done that, could you take that uh, could you take that manufactured label and, and and go buy that product uh, and 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 would it be and it would and would it be cheaper well, than buying it by the okay. prescription? Well, there's two qualifications to that. Number one is this: that uh, we don't do that in the store. There are some drugstores that do, but actually, it's it's not a good ethical practice to take your label and put it on the manufacturer's bottle. There's nothing illegal about it if you can do it. But we just don't do it. Uh, number two, you can't take that label. It is against the law to take that label off of that container and use it on any other container. No, they scratch it. They, they yeah. cut it off. With it. Well, no. What I had, what I had, I suppose uh, I've seen this happen too. The druggist didn't take the label off. He put the other one on on top of it. Just stuck it on there on mm -hmm. top. Of it. Could you take that other that prescription label off and take that bottle, that that patent medicine bottle, that he didn't take the label off of, and take it to another drugstore and no. pick up that same item? No. Uh, let me say this legally, no. Legally, if if you would come into our store, uh, you'd have to have a legitimate prescription from your doctor. If you if you bring your container in, which you can do. What we do, and we encourage people to do this, is bring your container in, we contact the, the drugstore number one to see if they will give us the prescription over the phone. If they do it, fine. Then we just simply call your doctor and verify that it's been transferred, ask him for authorization to refill it. He gives us that fine. If the drugstore doesn't do that, and in most cases, at once we're established in the city for about a week, you'll find that drugstores won't cooperate at all in our stores. Then you have to come in, we'll have to call your doctor, and we'll have to find out what medication you're on, and then the doctor will give it to us over the phone, we'll fill out a new prescription. But at the point you want to refill, you have to have that same container with that number, our label number on it. Because when you come back in the store, you say, give me a refill on this. We go back and we pull out that file, that old prescription with that number on it. And we open it up. If it says refillable one time or zero times, it can't legally, it cannot be refilled. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be with you. Yes, sir. You all want to take a break, get some coffee and come back? Or yeah. What do you want to do? I'm right. Well, it depends on how much might be in the show. Well, pretty soon I'm going to have to go. Oh, if you get, if we got anything else, out of time. put it well Well, down. we've pretty well covered it, yeah. uh, Paul. Uh, 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 well, I think we've got enough uh, information. Have we? Anybody got any more questions? Just one more question. Yeah. Did, you, did I understand to say one of these franchise drug stores would have a, a single price just for union people and other people that we certify? Or will the public come in and have a different price? You, they, you're right. In, in essence, what's going to 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 be very simple about it, in essence, what's, what's going to happen in a drugstore is you're going to have two prices okay. in a drugstore. You're going to have a two-price drugstore. You're going to have one price for all union members and their families. And I'm not say all union members. I qualify that by saying that it's it will be for the union members that are going to come in with these oh, cards. Well, that are whoever we members, designate right? can participate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever you designate, right? So you may have other associations. If if just in in most states you have to, if you have a pharmacy it has to be open to anybody. But they allow you to do a number of things. Some states allow you to discount. Other states allow you to have two or three prices. So what happens is that we will either discount and say we're discounting, but in essence, you end up with two prices. The union member is going to pay one, and anybody else is going to pay another. And the other price that they pay is about 12 to 14 percent more. Now that may or may not be less than what they're presently paying. If they're going to a local independent, that 12 percent may still be less than they're presently paying. But in any event, he's going to pay about. I would say roughly about 14% more for his drug than you and I would pay or the union member is going to pay or any of these association people that, that you would authorize to come in. For instance, if you authorized the uh, uh, Mississippi Association for the Blind Guys to come in and you would distribute their cards to them. Uh, in other words, the person who presents price. his membership card, he automatically gets the, the lower price. Right. And the, chances, have the chances are that the average guy that's not a member Chances are the price is going to be competitive even with the... But you find that we won't have many of those people in the store because when we make the mailing, it goes directly to union members and their family or Medicare people if we have a list. For instance, Des Moines, the community services people there got a list of all the senior citizens in the area 
through one of the welfare agencies. I don't know how the hell they got it, but they got it. I don't even know if it's legal, but in any event, when we made the mailing there, all those people got an ID card and the free prescription card, along with all these union members in the, in the area, so that you find that, and our advertising is all geared to a union member and his family. We don't say in the advertising that only a union member and his family can use the store, but when we launch it and we make all the advertising, it's all done on the basis that this is being you know, brought to the area through, for instance, in Louisville, we did it on the basis of through the Kentucky State AFL-CIO. So that the average guy who is not either in any of these organizations you approve or who is a union member isn't going to even come to the store. But you will find that after the store is open a while, you get a, I would say in most of our stores, probably three to four percent of the total business is people who don't belong to a labor union. It's a very, very small percentage. That's why when I said before, I'd emphasize that, as Sam said about the, 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 the lever that organized labor has, is that at the point that we lose the support, we're dead because in most cases, about 98% of the business in the store, total business in the store, is with the union member and his family or the people that they approve that come in, Medicare people or, or Association for the Blind or disabled people, something like that. You don't miss your standby flight. That's right. <laughs> I can either get that late one or I, I see they got they got some flights into Atlanta. I can connect into Atlanta too and go in. You, you guys want to decide what you want to do with this thing now? You want to get some coffee and come back? Now, if they vote this afternoon to to participate in the program, how how long will it be before you can, in other words, you go back, you have to start recruiting pharmacists and uh, how long will it take? I would say we should, we, we could probably, we would hope to have something definite as far as uh, pharmacists uh, by, by the end of January. And how long do you think it would be before you could actually have a store opened up? Uh, well, then it's, then it's a matter of, if, if we find a guy that has a location, for instance, that's a good location that we can convert. When I say convert, I'm just saying, in most cases what we do is we come in the store and we just got it out. All we need is a big open room because all of our fixtures are what we call freestanding fixtures. They're, they're bolted and they're all metal. And they have like a mahogany finish on the front. We put matching paneling on the wall, indoor outdoor carpeting on the floor, a ceiling like this and then we stock it and that's it now that takes us five weeks to do that if we have to remodel the place so if we find a store that doesn't need that much it would be less than five weeks. but let's just say we have a pharmacist at the end of january and whether it be jackson if you give me a list of, of your just where you have your councils and how many you have in the council we can take that plus an approximate number of senior citizens and uaw or teachers if you have them there and we can take try to then shoot for maybe the two or three biggest councils in the state and, and move in that direction. Or if you just want to target Jackson, we can start with Jackson first. But I would say if we can get a guy in January, chances are we can have that store ready to go in March, middle of March. That's what's going to And we had the pre-prescription thing maybe kick in, the, say, the 15th of March and run to the 15th of May, which will kick off. And then, it'll, you know, everything will be on the regular price. Yeah, I don't know. I'm holding off on one. I thought you might be That's a gal over there that spends a lot of money over there. She's uh, very anxious to get something going here. If you know what your if you know what your prescriptions are, what you know what the, what the like what the strength is and the amounts are and the prices are, that'd be a good uh, example I'll, right I'll, there. I'll yeah, she can provide you with this information you want. <laughs> I'll find out. What she Miss can't, Tom can't. can't. Tom can on yeah. what she can't. I've quit taking pills. Yeah. Well, I had mine <laughs> cut out. <laughs> what, uh, you guys want to decide this now, or you want to have the coffee and come back? What do you want to do? Or you want to uh, raise some more questions? Some of them in a hurry. But now, we only have one central body, Jackson, with a certain amount of affiliated members. we got the potential, but they're not affiliated with us, like. You mean here in Jackson? Here in Jackson, there's <coughs> only one that has, say, seven, eight thousand members affiliated. Well, but see that? Yeah. yeah we that, don't know for instance, it, you must have some cities in the state where you've got auto workers and teamsters and AFL. Well, we don't no have auto workers. No, 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 we no, 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 Texas, Georgia, Atlanta, some yeah. burgers. Yeah. Yeah. All the things we, we got assembled some was boot, bootleg whiskey. And then what about what about tractors or farm implements? Uh, oh, no. No, no, no. We've got uh, we've got Maybe a couple of areas that's got the potential, thing. but I think if we get into it, frankly, that 
that we are we, we need to set up a pilot area and to me Jackson would probably be the best place most central located to make it available to a mail order thing to everybody else so it gets moving good. See the other thing is as I said before and as, as Claude and I talked about is that you guys can sit down and, and, and determine if, who you want to open this up to so that in essence if you have even if you have a small community now I don't know what would be the next council in, in size is concerned but if you take for instance your average, your average city has a good, healthy percentage of, I, I would say that most of your cities probably have somewhere around 15 to 18 percent of the total population are over, over age 60 or over age that's, 65. That's, that's what it runs here, 15 right. to 18 For instance, now Sam, Sam indicates to me that in the Louisville area, that they've got, a, what, did, what did he say? I think he said they have in the vicinity of 30 to 40,000 over age 65 people right in the right in the yeah, central Louisville area. So you see, if you open it up to yeah. to Medicare people in the, in the area, plus your AFL CIO, and if you if you got some other organizations you want to work with, maybe locally you're working with uh, some states, for instance, your welfare people don't have drugs. Well, you could open it up to them. And well, there's uh, all kinds of there's all sure. So I, what I'm saying is that you can take a number of these different areas and. The other option that we've got is, is we did in, Wis in a small city up in, w in Wisconsin Rapids in Wisconsin, is they wanted the store so bad, we set up the store, we opened it up to Medicare people and union members and their families only to start out with. After the free prescription thing dropped off, yeah. we then opened it up to the general public. Yeah. Now the reason we, we did that it was at the request of the local council because they, we said that we can't do it. They said, well, can you put a store here? and bring in low-cost drugs if we agree to open it up to the public. And we said, yes, but we would only do it if your council decides to do that. So now all the other stores in the state are restricted. But in that area, as of this week, the press releases are going to come out now that the Wisconsin Rapids AFL-CIO, under their Community Action or Community Services Program, are going to uh, open up this discounting of prescription drugs to all residents of the greater Wisconsin Rapids area. So now that, that store will be set. Well, they'll have their own store in their own community, and there'll be enough potential there to keep that store going forever and a day. Just stand on all of the motion that we use Jackson as a pilot area, and then any other stores be channeled through the Mississippi AFL CIO and restrict control over them. Give me a second of that motion. In other words, you motion <coughs> is that we go ahead and authorize them, or at least we, we uh, you move that we do participate in the program, that it, that it be put under the control of the CFL CIO, and that we establish pilot stores in the Jackson area. Right. Right? We get a second of that motion. I'll second that. Uh, <coughs> Roger, uh, before we put this thing to a vote, we have a board meeting. Did y'all set the date of the board meeting? No, we didn't. We run into a little problem here that you and I hadn't thought about. You know, this uh, consumer thing is supposed to be on January 3rd. Yeah. And then you and I talked about probably February the 6th for a board meeting. Mm -hmm. And, of course, this is uh, creates a little problem here. We try and get attendance, you know, of our folks at the yeah. consumer thing. So yeah. I thought maybe we, we better talk. Open. We left it open. We better talk. Well, anyhow, the ch chances are we'll have a full meeting of our executive board in the month of February. And this means if you, we act here this afternoon, it means you've got to go ahead to go ahead and start doing the preliminary work. We thought about inviting Sam Ezell down and uh, to that board meeting. That time we'll have more time. And right. It won't be as jammed up as we've been here today. And uh, then then maybe you can come back in and we uh, you know, sure. can give a report to us what, what what's happening and give us a progress report. You know, because right. we've already, a lot of our people have already been making some inquiries on this as a result of me sending a brochure out to our board members. And, uh, right. yeah, and you would be able to come back sure. in for sure. that meeting, say, about the middle of February. <coughs> Just so, so you let me know a little right. in advance, because I, you know, I'm traveling quite a bit. Right. Well, well of course, oh, we get it set. Uh, sure. Y'all going to leave it up to me and Tom to try to set the date of the next board meeting? All right, are y'all? Don't y'all think it'd be a... Uh, would probably be we'd get a better picture of the success of the thing if we had two, one in Jackson, one in Pascagoula, because we got more union members in Pascagoula than we got in That's Jackson. That's true, too, but then, Mr. Rainey, I re might remind you that the most of the union members in Pascagoula don't belong to the AFL-CIO, Mississippi AFL-CIO. 
Yeah. What we want. That's that's part that's of the problem. That's the reason I made the motion in the mind. Which we I do did. it in Jackson, and then we'll give it to publicity, and them guys will be screaming down there, and then we'll just tell them, all right, get be, get back in this organization. We'll put one in your area. That's really the item behind it, right? Yes. That's I know what you're up to. We got any more discussion? I was out of the room when the motion was made. The motion is really that we participate and we set up, a, uh, I guess, a cup, whatever we, the, the survey indicates the need of. It may probably be about two stores in the Jackson area. It's a pilot site. And then we have control over And the then they, they be run through the city organization. You ready for the vote? All in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Well, you can get to work on it. All right. And as soon as we get the board meeting set, we'll let you know. Now, we got uh, some coffee and, 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 and cake back in the back. We're going to have a few minutes in celebration for Mr. Phillips' birthday. Uh, no, I